Recording in progress. The hour of 12.30 having arrived, and you all having arrived, I will call this session of the Santa Cruz City Council to order and ask for a, the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Perry Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Cooley? Here, the quorum having been established, we will uh, move to uh, uh, add to our closed session agenda today, 495 Upper Park Drive and appurtenances to the closed session agenda. Would need a motion to do that. Is there such a motion? There is so by moved. Council Member Watkins and seconded by Excuse me, Councilmember Brown. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. That item by unanimous consent has been added to our agenda for today. Let's move on to closed session. This is the opportunity for anyone who is either with us in chambers today or online to make comment on our closed session agenda. Uh, that closed session agenda is, uh, is published. It includes items four through seven uh, with the addition that we just made in addition to those that I have enumerated. So anyone with us today in chambers who would like to make comment on the closed session agenda? Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? There's no one online, no but one I, online. I do just wanna, sorry, Mayor, I do wanna um, include that two and three are also part of closed session. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry if I didn't say that. Thank you very much. No one uh, wishing to make comment on the agenda. We will stand in recess to closed session. We will return at one of a couple of times uh, here, we will uh, return to an open, an open session and we will report out. That will be at or about 3.30 p.m. this afternoon.
The hour of 3.30 having arrived, we will reconvene in our council meeting for the afternoon session on March 28, 2023. The clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Quorum having been established, we will move on to our agenda. We are going to have a, a two special presentations today, and the first one is especially special. We are going to be hearing from Laura Marcus, the CEO of Dientes. Thank you. I think I know that I speak on behalf of all the council members. Thank you for what you're doing. We're very excited about your new building, all the new things that you're doing around town and around the county. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I, I so appreciate that. Good afternoon, council members and Mayor Fred Keeley. I am Laura Marcus, CEO of Deanthus Community Dental Care and founder of Oral Health Access Santa Cruz County. This coalition of health and social service providers, government, and education partners is focused on increasing access to dental care and improving the oral health of our community. Today, I especially want to commend City Council Member Martine Watkins, who's been participating on behalf of the County Office of Education since OHA's inception. Martine has been a steadfast supporter and advocate for improved oral health in our community, and we greatly, greatly appreciate your work. Now I'd like to share an update on OHA's activities, results, and future plans. Next slide. First, some history. In 2015, Deanthus conducted the first ever oral health needs assessment for the region and shared the findings widely at an oral health summit in 2016. At the summit, we also introduced members of the newly formed OHA steering committee who had been tasked with reviewing the data and recommendations and developing a strategic plan. Next slide. The first OHA strategic plan included the following goals for 2020. Increasing dental visits for children aged zero to three, maintaining dental visits and increasing the number of kids with a dental home for children aged four to six, and increasing the number of Santa Cruz County residents with access to quality dental care by expanding services and sites. Next slide. None of this work would be possible alone. One of the greatest benefits of involving such a wide swath of leaders from different organizations in our community was sharing their expertise and resources toward a common goal. You can see here the members of the steering committee, all of whom have contributed widely toward our success. I also want to mention the state of California, which funded OHA activities with a $1 million grant in 2017 and another $1 million in 2022. Next slide. OHA activities have included launching a first tooth, first birthday education campaign with First Five and Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency to reach new parents and their health care providers. Promoting kindergarten oral health screenings with the local schools and the County Office of Education. Recruiting more mid-level providers and pediatric dentists at Deanthus and Salud and building new sites to increase capacity. Our dental providers trained medical staff how to apply fluoride varnish at well child visits, which is now reimbursable by Central California Alliance for Health and as a standard of care. Lastly, we launched an oral health and pregnancy media campaign and prioritized seeing pregnant women during their first trimester at both Dientes and Salud. Next slide. The results of these activities have been phenomenal, as evidenced by the report card OHA published in 2021. After almost seven years working together, OHA has made significant progress. Before I share these results, one important thing to note is that the data in these slides are reflecting our medical population only and don't include people who are uninsured or underinsured. Next slide. The good news is there's been significant, a significant increase in access to care since 2014 with a 25% increase in medical patients visiting the dentist. That's 6,000 more people accessing dental care on an annual basis. Yay. Next slide. 
It's considered best practice to bring your baby to the dentist at their first tooth, first birthday, whichever comes first. Our 2021 report card showed that there's been a 60% increase in the number of kids to and under with annual dental visits. That's over 50% of our local Medi-Cal babies and toddlers with an annual dental visit versus the statewide average of only 25%. Next slide. More children going to the dentist by their first tooth, first birthday can have a ripple effect. The same is true for fluoride application at well baby and child visits. We're seeing fewer kindergartners entering school with cavities, and there's been a 79% increase in kids with the dental home. Next slide. The last piece of good news to report is the increase in the number of adults receiving dental services due to the growth of clinics and providers at Dientes and Salud. Today, 75% more medical adults are accessing dental care. Next slide. But now some hard news. As you can imagine, there's still a lot of unmet need and our medical population is only growing. Last year, our research partner, Barbara Avid and Associates conducted a new needs assessment, which looked at data from 2019. This was due to the dramatic drop in services during COVID. Avid compared the new data to the original data from 2014. And although we've made some great progress as mentioned, especially with our youngest, most vulnerable kids, there are some populations that still need attention. Next slide. The proportion of people who make annual dental visits hits a peak at, of 68% in the age range of six to nine. Then we see a decrease starting in the teen and tween years, dropping to under 20%, 21%, excuse me, after age 20. Dental visits remain low, as you can see, through adulthood. Next slide. This drop in adults accessing care is shocking, especially if you consider the repercussions of poor oral health, which can have so many detrimental effects on your overall health and well-being. The 2022 needs assessment showed that only one in four medical adults in the county accessed dental care. Next slide. The problem gets worse as our population ages. Utilization of dental services drops to 27% at age 60 and is less than 25% by age 75. Gum disease in seniors is widespread and this leads to worse health outcomes as they age, in particular as it contributes to dementia, Alzheimer's, heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and poor diabetes outcomes. And this is in addition to the challenge of one in four seniors having lost all of their natural teeth. Even though regular dental visits and preventative care can dramatically reduce the incidence of gum disease and poor, or, poor oral health at an affordable cost, exacerbating this problem is that our country continues to exclude dental benefits as part of Medicare. Next slide. Before I get to solutions, I wanted to share uh, some important data on utilization of dental services by race and ethnicity. We're happy to say that we have considered equity in the work OHA has done over these years and successfully communicated bilingual and bicultural oral health information and education. In fact, 48% of Medi-Cal patients identifying as Hispanic and 30% of those identifying other have utilized dental services as compared to only 25% of whites. Next slide. <clears throat> so now for the future. OHA's work on expanding access for kids and adults will continue. And as most of you know, Deanthus recently opened a beautiful new dental clinic in Live Oak, which will serve another 6,000 new patients by 2024, with more plans to expand downtown soon. But based on this most recent data, we know we have more work to do. In the coming years, OHA and its partners are exploring expanding its focus with more outreach, education, and direct services for youth and teens and partnering with health providers and the Alliance and others on increasing education and access for people with diabetes. But we're also thrilled to announce a new focus on seniors with a $5 million five-year grant awarded to us just a few weeks ago by Delta Dental. Next slide. With this new grant, Dientes will partner with Salud and OHA to help us expand access to dental care for low-income seniors in our community. This competitive grant was the only the second awarded in the nation and the only grant awarded in California. And this is a direct result of the collaborative work that OHA has been doing and the successes we have achieved over the past seven years. We're so excited about the opportunity to support more seniors in our community. And we'll share more as we figure out what we're gonna do with it. <laughs> Lastly, we couldn't have achieved improved oral health outcomes in Santa Cruz without your many years of support. So thank you for that. 
and thank you for your attention today. And I welcome any questions you have. Thank you so much for your presentation. Let me see if there are questions or comments by council members. Please. I just want to say, um, as an educator for the past 20 years, I really appreciate all the work that Deantes has done in collaboration with the schools. From I used to be a kindergarten teacher in South County for five years and come out twice a year, do teeth brushing lessons, and then along with the screenings and checkups and things like that, where you literally bring like a mobile dentist office to the school a couple times a year. And I think it's just fantastic. The practitioners that are out there have great bedside manner, and it's just a wonderful experience that I've seen over the last two decades. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Council Member Watkins. I just want to thank you, Laura, for your leadership in our community. There's a reason why we're funded this new grant, and it's really, truly because of you and your just steadfast commitment to this work, to also expanding what's possible. And I think about the successes that you brought up with the various partners and the first tooth, first birthday, the marketing, all the different aspects that go into seeing that success. And so I just want to, it's an honor to be a part of this committee and to do the work and just really thank you for your vision and leadership to actualize these really important goals. So we appreciate you. Other council members? Yeah. Ms. Bruner. A big thank you for providing the care and access to our community um, who, is, who really needs it. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you guys. So much. Well, it. we all feel good about you because you're doing so much to make children and others feel so good about themselves. So God love you. Thank you very, very much for being here today. Thanks Best so wishes to you. Thank you. All right. We have yet another presentation this afternoon, and this will be an overview of the two major water department capital improvement projects, Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant Facility, and uh, also uh, the Newell Creek Pipeline Replacement Project is both vital uh, public infrastructure projects. And we have Ms. Menard and, uh, and a colleague. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, I wanted to just take a real a quick opportunity to introduce Kevin Crossley, who's the senior engineer and the program director for the Santa Cruz Water Program, which is our major capital program. You have an item a little bit later on your agenda for some funding for us, so that's really great. But I know there's some really uh, large projects that most of you haven't been able to come up and see, although we hope to remedy, remedy that this uh, summer, uh, that are really important to our community. And I thought it would be a really good opportunity for you to see uh, some information about those. So with that, Kevin Cross. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Rosemary. So I'm going to talk about a couple really big projects that are uh, part of the group of projects that are going to be included in the WIFIA funding that's uh, going to be later on in your agenda today. So uh, we thought this would provide a little bit of context and uh, background on the importance of what we're doing, where we've come, and where we're going. We good on presentation? All right. So I'm going to start with the Newell Creek Pipeline, uh, Felton the Graham Hill project. This is uh, one of the two projects I'll be presenting on today. Oh. Sharing. Ms. Bush will help you get that done, as she does with so many people. Ms. Good. Bush, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So the Newell Creek Pipeline Project, we'll start with some background. Uh, this is a really critical pipeline, arguably the most critical pipeline in the water system. It connects Loch Lomond Reservoir to the uh, Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, the city's only surface water treatment plant. And it literally runs over the mountains and through the woods. Uh, for anybody who's toured parts of it, it uh, it's installed in some pretty hairy places, including 
a section along Pipeline Road, which is what we have on screen here, uh, in Henry Cal State Park. So uh, besides age being one of its vulnerabilities, it uh, goes through, it's threatened by a number of uh, natural hazards, including wildfire, landslides, and of course, in California, seismic risks. Uh, not to mention tree falls, which can also damage it. So, um, technically speaking, it's been a basket case over the last five years. Uh, in 2017, we had four emergency repairs uh, due to the super saturated soil conditions that are common in that area. And in 2019, we had an emergency repair, 2020, an emergency repair. And our repair count for this year is up to two. Hopefully, that's going to be the end of it. Although uh, the extreme weather that we've been experiencing over the last five years suggests that this is partly going to be the new norm for this particular pipeline and uh, infrastructure. And uh, as Rosemary likes to say, uh, this is no way to run a railroad. Uh, sometimes these, these breaks have threatened to cause a serious water supply shortage. And so the good news is that we have a plan. Uh, we completed a planning study and identified uh, three discrete segments that we're going to replace in phases. And we're starting with the highest priority segment, which is the piece that runs from Belton near the Roaring Camp Railroad to the water treatment plant at 715 Graham Hill Road. And the, the main plan is to relocate the pipeline out of Pipeline Road entirely, abandon that right away, get away from a lot of those landslide and fire hazards that threaten the pipeline currently, and put it in a much uh, wider, easier to access right of way long term. And I've got some project cost on screen here. Uh, the total cost is currently estimated at 41 million. And we have already completed a number of key milestones. The project EIR was certified last year. We completed a design this year, and we're working hard on securing easements, which are the final piece of the puzzle for right-of-way, and then we hope to bring that back to council uh, in addition to a, the request to bid the project this October. And then, uh, all things willing, uh, this time next year, we should be under construction and hopefully complete with the project in 2025. So that was the easy project. Um, next, we're going to talk about the, it's a mouthful, Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant Facility Improvement Project, which we, out of necessity, dubbed the FIP. Um, this is a uh, top to bottom comprehensive modernization of the water treatment plant. Uh, the treatment plant was built in the late 1950s, around the same time as that pipeline. And we've been basically uh, having to meet ever more stringent Reg, uh, regulations with the same 1950s tools and technologies that came with the original plant. And it's really become quite challenging, not to mention the aging infrastructure, seismic risks, and other regulations that we see in the, in the future that we'll need to comply with in order to continue providing safe, clean, reliable water. And so, uh, like with the pipeline, a couple of years ago, we undertook a planning process and identified uh, the needs for this facility to operate into the 21st century. And what we came up with is uh, pretty much a top to bottom replacement of all the key uh, treatment processes. Everything in tan here is replacement of an existing process. The round uh, bubbles at the bottom are tanks that are actually under construction as we speak. And so uh, at the end of this project, we'll have pretty much uh, replaced, upgraded, improved every aspect of the treatment plant, including the operations buildings and other uh, key places where our staff work to ensure that it's able to withstand anything that climate change, earthquakes in the future holds for us. And uh, a couple other things that are notable about this project is it's uh, located on a very uh, constrained built out site. There's really no room to work. So we're gonna be ripping apart this treatment plant and rebuilding it while it's continuing to operate 24 seven, 365. And so one of the ways that we've mitigated the potential risks of doing that is through the use of a, a collaborative project delivery method, which is called progressive design build. We actually had to go through a charter amendment in order to enable the city to uh, use that delivery method. And so what that does is it allows us to get the designer and contractor who will ultimately build the project at the table early to start figuring out all the sequencing, uh, logistics, uh, other risks that come along with undertaking such a project at such a critical facility to ensure it goes as smoothly as we can 
uh, and make it a successful project. Uh, we've hit a couple key milestones. We recently completed the 30% design, which was a big turning point for us, and we're in the process of reviewing our admin draft EIR. A couple council touch points coming up are gonna be the certification of that EIR in the winter of this year, potentially as soon as this year or spring of 2024. And then uh, after hitting a couple more design milestones, we're uh, aiming for summer 2024 to finalize pricing which is a, a combination of negotiated and bidding processes with the design build team to establish the phase two pricing for construction. This is the biggest capital project in our program at the moment. It's uh, presently estimated uh, almost $160 million uh, in future dollars for construction. So really quick to wrap it up, uh, the WIFI alone and by extension these projects are how we're going to continue to provide safe, clean, reliable water into the future and thank you for your consideration and time. Thank you very much for your thoughtful and informative presentation. Let me ask if there are council members who have questions or comments on this item. Ms. Watkins. Thank you for the presentation. And I've been on the council, so I've seen over time kind of this come about. I'm just wondering your thoughts on just the extreme weather events we've had in the more recent years and the urgency to upgrade this critical component of our infrastructure. What, what we've been seeing is an increase in what it's commonly called whiplash weather. You've seen lots of new terms uh, about what our weather these days. We have uh, atmospheric rivers that we didn't used to talk about. We have bomb cyclones that we didn't used to talk about, and we have whiplash weather, which is this, uh, this increase in the uh, more wet, wet years and more dry, dry years, and hardly any normal in the middle. So Goldilocks weather and water supply is kind of like a thing of the past, and I think that's really, it's a big challenge for our system. Uh, we don't have enough storage to get us through the dry situation, and the challenges of aging infrastructure, uh, and some of the constraints of the existing treatment process, which will be solved by the work that we're doing here, will make that more reliable in the wet, wet situation. But flooding, uh, there are other parts of our facilities, uh, um, the Coast Pump Station there right by that Metro Center on, you know, these are things that are very uh, affected by uh, flooding events that we've had pretty commonly in this year and also in 2017. So a lot of our our work is driven to build in climate adaptation and adaptability to future more extreme climates. We've done a lot of work trying to understand what that looks like. And I think we have some pretty robust tools to help us do uh, appropriate planning to make our projects and facilities climate uh, adapted and resilient in the face of this uncertainty. Great. We're all good. Well, thank you so very much. We appreciate that. This is one of our core functions in municipal government. It's not out there as sort of a, gee, that'd be a nice thing to do if we could. Uh, this is a must do and we can and we shall. So thank you very, very much for that. Appreciate it. Members, we are on announcements by the presiding officer. Let me ask if the following makes sense to you. This is a presiding officer question. For me, it would be easier if the microphones were here, and if you wanted to speak, they went here. Because right now, they're here, and they're, I have to look around, I'm not sure. So would it work for you if we sort of kept our microphones down, and you want to speak, you put it up. That'll just make the presiding easier for me, which will then facilitate us doing our business. Is that okay with you? Everybody okay with that? As long as you're okay. Yeah. I just have one comment. The microphone won't be up here for Russell. That'll teach us to buy good products. All right. All right. Uh, well, that was my uh, presiding officer's announcement of the day. I'm sure that'll never be forgotten. Uh, Statement of disqualification. Anybody have a disqualification they need to disclose at this point? Seen and nearing none. Additions and deletions. Madam there are none. City no. Clerk. There are none. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, we are on the city attorney report of closed session. Good afternoon, Ms. Brooks. Good afternoon. Okay, uh, the council met in closed session today and uh, they met with its labor negotiator and discussed negotiations with respect to SEIU temporary employees. The council met with its rear, real property negotiator to discuss two properties, uh, 8.15 acres at Mount Hermon in Scotts Valley and the address 495 Upper Park Drive. The council met in closed session um, to meet with its legal counsel and discuss one liability claim. The council met uh, again with its legal counsel to discuss the existing litigation that's described in the closed session agenda. Uh, those matters are County of Santa Cruz et al. versus Purdue Pharma et al. And also the matters uh, City of Santa Cruz versus Regents and Regents versus City of Santa Cruz. And on those two matters, uh, at the council's last closed session meeting on March 14th, and as a means of trying to work toward potential resolution of these two litigated matters with the regents, the council gave the mayor direction to, one, uh, testify in front of the board of regents, indicating the council's non-opposition to the Student Housing West project, and two, uh, meet with the regents to discuss these pending litigated matters. At today's closed session, uh, the council voted in favor of ratifying those decisions. And on uh, matter six and seven that were on today's closed session agenda, those items were actually not discussed in closed session today. And those are one item of a significant exposure to litigation and one item of potential initiation of litigation. Is that for me? Thank you. Thank you very much. We are on item 10. We will review the meeting calendar. Ms. Bush, are there any additions you would like to bring to our attention? I have done, no. Thank you, Ms. Bush. We are on the consent agenda. And this is items 11 through 23 inclusive. Those who are unfamiliar with this, we will take all of these items on one motion. Uh, so what we will do first here is we will get uh, comments from members of the city council on the consent agenda. Uh, I will start with Ms. Bruner, then go to Ms. Brown. Ms. Bruner. I have um, brief comments on item 13, Santa Cruz County Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission nomination. Item 14, Senate Bill 43, Conservatorship Reform and SB 363 Behavioral Health Bed Database. And item 21, Site Logic IQ Harvey West Park Ball Field Lighting Project. And I want to make sure you're not requesting those be taken off. Not please, requesting. Please proceed with your comments. Thank you. So uh, item 13, I just wanted to thank you, Bob Nelson, Public Works Operations Manager, for um, uh, serving on this Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission. Item 14, I just wanted to um, say uh, for members of the public to we, this is an item, Senator Edmonds um, bills, there was a whole eight bill package introduced last year that um, we have been supporting and this is um, continuation and part of all of our work to support members in our community and um, part of our work is advocacy to the state level. So um, I'm, I just wanted to set that context. Item 21, thank you to Tony Elliott, Parks and Rec Director, for answering my questions in advance regarding dark sky lighting at the Harvey West Park ball field. Um, you know, since we had that dark sky lighting presentation last, last year, um, I really kind of look at lighting differently now. And so when I saw this solar project, um, I was really happy um, and wanted to share that the lighting will be downward facing as well as low energy and more environmentally friendly. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brunner. Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I want, I would like to pull upon request of a member of the public item 14, uh, Senate Bill 43 and 363. And then I have uh, 
comment on item 17 and 20 and 21. Please proceed with your comments. Thank you. So um, on item, item 17 is the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Development Project ground lease authorization for the parcel on Lincoln Street. And um, I just wanted to share, I had received a lot of questions from members of the public, um, which I kind of uh, consolidated and did uh, reach out to Bonnie Lipscomb. Thank you for getting back to me on once again, a pretty late uh, request for info. Um, but I, so I just wanted to say thank you for that and um, also let members of the public know that I can generally say the responses were that the concerns were about transferability of leases and um, uh, affordability and perpetuity, and um, I got responses about how that's going to be handled, and I feel very comfortable with that. So if people have out there who are listening have specific questions in response to the questions you all asked me, feel free to reach out, but I did want to share that. Uh, and then on item 20, this is, the, this is a big item. <laughs> it's our um, housing element uh, general plan progress report. So I just wanted to um, give a shout out to Catherine Donovan, who um, has uh, worked on this, uh, <laughs> given in her heart and soul, um, and just really so appreciate it. Um, and I did just want to ask the question, because I ask this every time, um, uh, about the role of the planning commission in this. I, I know that they are going to be involved in conversations about uh, how we move forward with our housing element and so I'm and I know and they haven't they don't get it um, as a standard matter of course and so I just want to ask about that thank you Ms. Brown good afternoon, good afternoon Mayor afternoon, Mr. Butler. thank you Mayor Keeley and uh, Councilmember Brown, thanks for that question. Um, we, what we typically do and what we've done for the past few years is um, we present the information that we present to you to the council as an informational item. Um, so that will um, go to the planning commission. Um, usually at their next meeting, I think we've got one um, the third Thursday in uh, April when this will be presented to them. Thank you. Um, it, it just seems like it would be nice for them to be able to comment before we approve, but um, I understand the. Um, it's it's they generally do get been to a, see it. it's generally been a timing issue, um, as you could tell from the spreadsheet that's attached. There's quite a bit of information. Um, I am hopeful that um, probably not next year, but the year after that, as we get a new permit tracking system in place, that we'll be able to pull more of this information um, through reporting um, that we don't have the capability to do with our current system. And so um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get this uh, sooner in, in future years. While I've got the mic, I'll make a plug that our next housing element is posted and um, folks can um, reference that through our website, cityofsantacruz.com slash housing element. We're accepting comments on that draft through April 23rd. Yay, we didn't yes. even set that up. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then I, I just have one last item. Um, so that this is um, also on 21, Council Member Bruner mentioned. Um, and I did, uh, I received a, an email, I think we all got it, from the um, International Dark Skies Association local chapter about uh, con ongoing concerns. I think they really are supportive of um, moving forward, but um, would love to be involved in the, the conversation about how to address those um, controls and mitigations around light seepage or leak leakage. Um, I can't remember the official term. Um, and, and that sounded like it was okay with the public works director, um, Nathan Nguyen, Nguyen, when I reached out. So I'm just hoping we could just add that direction to include them in the process. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor is recognized. I just have a comment on 22. Please proceed. So um, item 22 is, and I'm glad that we're doing this. We have an emergency uh, generator, and it's a fuel cost associated with that to keep our wastewater treatment plant up and running. Mm -hmm. And I just want to bring this to everybody's attention that this is a, another reason why, with the current storms, I don't feel like we're completely ready for total electrification. I don't think the infrastructure is there. I want to remind everybody about the thousands of people without power throughout the county that are running um, 
generators and running their heat with propane, kerosene, natural gas, other gas, um, wood. And so I just, I'm for moving forward with electrification when the infrastructure is there. And I think this is another example, but we're not there yet. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Other questions or comments regarding the consent agenda? Councilmember Brown has asked that agenda item 14 be separated out here. Shall we take this up? Would you like conversation at this point about it? Um, How would you like to proceed? I, either way, I, we can move the rest of the consent and okay. then take Let's it up. Let's go ahead. Let me offer the opportunity to those of you who are in chambers, anyone wish to address the council regarding the consent agenda except for item 14? Seeing and hearing none, let me ask Ms. Bush if we have anyone online regarding the consent agenda. We do, yes. Let's go to that person. How many do we have, Ms. Bush? One right now. One, very good, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and Council. I wanna follow up with um, Vice Mayor Golder's comments on item 22. Um, I do think it is a prime example that we're not ready to get rid of natural gas in our built infrastructure. In fact, my understanding, although it's not in the uh, staff's report, that there are two diesel generators that are gonna be installed. And um, I think everyone, no matter where you stand on, on climate, um, greenhouse gas emissions, I certainly think they're real and human cause, but natural gas is just a lot cleaner than diesel. And what happens when we don't have natural gas in buildings for critical infrastructure. We have to rely on diesel backup generators. And I do have, um, so I think Vice Mayor's comments are exactly on point. And this is just one reason why the infrastructure isn't ready, but um, it's an important one. In fact, City Hall campus has a, um, a large diesel generator. And I sent, um, in your packet, I sent uh, some photos of it. You can see the, the vent stacks out of the tank and it's venting into the atmosphere. Now, on the other hand, the library just on the street has a natural gas backup generator. This gets me to my other point about the wastewater treatment facility. It has two very large methane, methane digesters uh, that have a capacity of producing 1.3 megawatts, which is a very, very large amount of electricity. And I'm wondering if you could ask staff, I have a series of questions in my letter to you, um, six very straightforward questions about the usage of these methane digesters and whether they're used to capacity currently or whether instead of uh, the diesel or maybe lessening the diesel generators, if, if they're not used to capacity, if we could use uh, PG&E piped in natural gas in these methane digesters to plant some of the diesel because we all know that that's going to be less polluting and the city now is making a concerted effort to reduce its emissions and its pollution so i think that could be a one way if that's possible where the city could walk and talk a little bit but i really think you should carefully consider the whole thing with building electrification i think that staff has oversimplified it it's uh it's a you're going to have perverse effects if you just rush forward and have these mandates because um there's a lot of ways where if you just get rid of all natural gas we're going to create actually more uh greenhouse gas emissions so thank you very much and i would appreciate it there's six questions i don't have time to read them all but i think um they're in your packet and uh, i would appreciate if you delved into that with staff thank you very much well, thank you very much. Let me see if this is acceptable to you. What we will do is with respect to your letter uh, that is in the packet, if I could ask that uh, uh, Mr. Huffaker, if you would be kind enough to be certain that that is responded to in the appropriate way by the appropriate folks. Thank you very much on that. Uh, good afternoon. I am uh, assuming, sir, that you wish to make comment on the consent agenda? That, certainly. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I haven't spoke here in quite some time. Well, welcome back. Well, let's hope you still continue to think that. Um, 
As far as this emergency electrical, it's, uh, I'm almost not sure really where to begin. I haven't been here in a while. Almost half of you have heard me speak in front of you at least 150 times. Um, oil is the second most plentiful fuel on the planet next to water. Oil is ever regenerating itself due to natural plate tectonics. I think it was in 1896 that Rockefeller and a couple other criminals created fossil fuels. So I've noticed as a building contractor the past 15 years how natural gas is somewhat being eliminated and in some towns, like even recently within the last 18 months, Scotts Valley, the, you're no longer allowed to install new, new, natural new natural gas. It just seems interesting. There's the only feedback that I can really reflect that I know about are the electric garbage trucks in New York, which are, they can't even do four hours of work, where, you know, hydro, modern hydraulics and modern diesels, that equipment is designed to sometimes run for millions of hours. So electrical is not really going to lead people to the answers that they're looking for. And uh, all the language that's used in this room, sustainability, you know, it's really just subterfuges. And um, I'm glad I get to speak on number 14, too. I actually forgot my notebook about what I was going to talk about. So I'm either going to look at the book or shoot from the hip. Well, thank you so much. Welcome back. I suspect we'll hear from you again and would appreciate your comments. Anyone else who uh, is on the line? No one else on the line. Last call here. Anyone who is with us in chambers that wishes to comment on the consent agenda minus item 14. Uh, all you're going to do is do that. I'll move the yeah, consent moving agenda. Moving the consent agenda. I'll second. A second. I want to make sure that we are clear that will include on with the, with the, the exception addition, of item well oh. with the exception of item 14 and with the additional direction that ms brown requested on i believe it was item 21 21 thank you very much uh, i i'm sorry i think it was actually item 20 was it the uh, annual housing element and general plan that you wanted to include some group of folks in that? That was 20. It's 21, the, the ball field lighting. Oh, it's the ball field lighting. Thank you for the clarification. That language will be added. Ms. Bruner? I wonder if I may just briefly comment that um, that direction has been done, and I have been in correspondence with um, the person who emailed, and I know this morning they were also um, contacted by city staff, and they responded. Um, they look forward to working uh, together. So, I think it's covered then. Thank you. No yes. need then for that additional direction. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, for the questions, comments, or debate, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll on the consent agenda minus, minus, four, minus item 14. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes in so order. We are on item 14 from the consent agenda. Ms. Brown, you ask that that be heard separately. This is your opportunity. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I did pull this item uh, for, upon request of a member of the public. Um, I have heard from uh, many people, um, uh, or at least a handful of people uh, who have expressed concerns about the, uh, the legislation as it currently is written um, for, for a variety of reasons, and I share some of those concerns. Um, so I, I really wanted to give members of the community who made the request an opportunity to speak on this and um, and then we can come back around and take action. To make sure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Council Member Brown, for parsing this out. I would like to draw to your attention this research book. Let me ask you if you'd be kind enough to state your name for the record. Thank My you. My name is Rhonda Reyna. I was here last time because I'm very concerned about rescuing 
kidnap children in our community who are actually victims of nefarious doctors who tell lies. This book, AFCC.net, AFCC Net, that you can find on Amazon, is a book that follows the mother of both the Fatherhood and Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, and shows how each contribute and generate worlds of tainted research, training, and treatment methods. I sent a letter that um, all of you have access to read where it is easily proven that doctors tell lies in order to take children away from their loving parents in court. So as I read Senate Bill 43, and we also have AB 665 coming up, these are very dangerous, and we must not allow these to pass whatsoever. Hearsay is not acceptable testimony in court. The reason why we have protections in court is so that we can do a proper voir dire, a rigorous cross-examination, and parse out this whole book of practitioners who will be paid to lie. There are dads who pay doctors to take the children away from their parents. I haven't seen my child in 633 days. Here are pictures of us doing normal mommy and daughter things. And I know many of you have children. She was wrongfully taken from me because we reported abuse. VAWA should have protected us, and it did not. Factually speaking, I can say from all the 58,000 parents of the kidnapped children per year, we're all getting together, we're doing research, and now it's 100% of the time when a child and a parent reports domestic violence, abuse, sexual assault, that the courts are taking the kids away from their parents. And it is supported by sickos. In this book, Dr. Rebecca Bailey, who has tortured my daughter as a reunification therapist, and in the Johnston Rossi versus Rossi second appellate decision, it is proven that she hasn't even done a program that is acceptable. So we all need to look at this and we need to smash down any of these bills that would seek to bypass the protections of due process. And we cannot rely on these experts. The age of experts is over because they can be bought off to tell lies. And it's up to each one of us to become our own experts. We have the internet. We can do research. There's parents who are writing entire books about this. So I am begging you, please, 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 none of you support this bill. Put it down. Um, Senate Bill 43, AB 665, and anything like that. And thank you very much for putting this on the agenda and parsing it out. I really appreciate your attention to this matter. Thank you very much. Anyone else who is with us wish to provide testimony on item 14? Good afternoon again, sir. Hi. Hi. I'm still James. So... Yeah, I've had some personal experience with the family law system. I can say if you're going to piss off six lawyers on the other side, don't be surprised when they use your best against you. But uh, moving forward, it's been seven years. So I also recommend some caution here. There's a lot of double speak. Um, there's a lot of legislation that's been passed in the past two and a half years. My understanding where it used to take only one, quote, expert at what, I don't know mostly from what I observe, lying. Um, two supposed people to give you a 5150 or something, now it just takes one. So, you know, the children are the future of humanity, and uh, I think there's a lot of things to question. Uh, I mean, I'll choose not to be mean. I was really hoping Tony was going to be here. Uh, maybe he'll be here later. But um, the amount of misinformation, and there's not a time thing working I won't take three minutes, but um, there's a lot of misinformation, you know, and there's been a lot of uh, money laundering and, and child trafficking and stuff going on for decades. You know, why actually was the Ukrainian war, why did Russia go in there? You know, it seems like in the past two weeks, the reason why um, Russia went in there has been flipped on Vladimir Putin, saying something about the children. That's absolutely right. When that, gov when that government was taken over by the puppet U.S. government in 2014, you know, that was long before um, gain of function and other bioweapons were being produced. There was clear information from before 1994 and all the presidents since. So Vladimir Putin realized that since 2014, like you said, over 14,000 parents had been murdered by the... Uh, Nazi establishment, which seems to have its mirror in California, unfortunately. And um, when those 30,000 orphans started showing up dead on U.S. soil, he acted. 
and he rescued those 30,000 children. Well, I'm actually here because I care. That's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Further on item 14, so hearing none, a motion, yes. I have somebody on, online. Thank you very much. Someone who's joining us online, it's your opportunity to speak. Good afternoon. And this is Jasmine, who we're giving five minutes to. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Welcome. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, my name is Jasmine Mia, and I am speaking on behalf of Santa Cruz Cares. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist who works with clients with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. We understand that this item is about Mayor Keeley sending letters to support Senate Bills 43 and 363. We would like to state our opposition to sending a letter of support for SB 43, conservatorship reform. The expanded definition of gravely disabled is extremely problematic as it adds risk of harm, quote, as a result of substance use disorder. This seems like it could be used discriminatorily and especially against the unhoused. SB 43 would define serious harm as, quote, among other things, attend to needed personal or medical care and attend to self-protection or personal safety. Doesn't each person get to decide what they consider their personal safety or protection? This is much too loose of a definition that could lead to locking up anyone with a substance use disorder, which can include excessive alcohol use, by the way, regardless of housing status. But this is clearly meant for the unhoused, which is later stated in the discussion of the city council agenda report. That portion says this is, quote, meant to address the cycle that many individuals with severe mental illness face between homelessness and treatment, filling emergency rooms, incarceration, overdose, or death. This proves that this intends to impact our unhoused neighbors. With SB 43, people could be involuntarily committed and even conserved for up to a year for substance use disorder. And it seems clear that the intent is to reduce the burden on our emergency rooms and jails, but at the cost of personal freedoms and autonomy. This is yet another way to get rid of houseless people, and it is framed as a compassionate response, but it is really a punitive carceral response. We would also like to explain the problems of a hearsay exception for medical history contained in the medical record. The medical record can be subjective and biased. It is not under penalty of perjury like a witness. I have, unfortunately, seen many colleagues who were not trained well in record keeping. I have also seen as a patient subjective wording painting a narrative to which I disagreed in my own medical record. I would just hate for us to take the word of you know the record, which is made by a lot of different providers and it be inaccurate. I took a look at Mayor Keeley's letter of support, which says that the current definition of gravely disabled is quote, inadequate to address the real needs in our communities and often leads to criminalization and jail rather than treatment. The issue we're seeing is that this would be treatment by force. As a therapist, my opinion is that people change when they are ready to change and accept help. Locking people up against their will is not likely to lead to meaningful and lasting treatment. Lastly, while NAMI California supports Care Courts, a similar initiative, NAMI of Santa Cruz County does not. So I would urge you to at least consult with them on what they think about SB 43. Um, I used to speak for NAMI, ending the silence, and I've reached out to them, um, haven't heard back yet about what they think and how to get involved opposing this. Santa Cruz Cares is all about providing services, but not in a punitive, criminalizing, or forced way. We urge you to not send a letter of support for SB 43, and in fact, send a letter with opposition. We hope you can work with our representatives to express the concerns shared and create a more just process for those whose rights would be taken away. Again, you know, when I look at this, it's just, it just seems very troubling that they added as a result of substance use disorder, which was not there before, it was mental health uh, disorder only, and adding that even though they say that it's not substance use disorder alone, that could get you conserved or, you know, involuntarily committed. There is the danger that, um, you know, that's really subjective if they think that's impacting someone's personal safety um, or ability to take care of their needs. And I could just see that being used, you know, overly so when it really shouldn't be. And like I said, since substance use, they include and even say in the bill, this includes alcohol use disorder. I mean, that's a lot of people who struggle with substance, you know, use issues and including alcoholism. And so we're talking like people, regardless of housing status, could be technically impacted by this. You know, if someone wanted to claim, hey, you're drinking too much and that's affecting your personal safety or your ability to care for yourself, those people could be involuntarily committed and then, you know, conserved for up to a year. And that could affect our housed, you know, neighbors as well. And I don't think people want that. So even if the idea here is to get people off the streets and into treatment, it's um, it could be broadly used and just extremely problematic. So 
really urge you to take a closer look and not support this and definitely not send a letter of support. But, you know, again, try to work with um, our representatives for a better uh, a better way going forward that really respects people's rights and autonomy. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Further folks, Ms. Push, okay. online. Anybody who is with us additionally? Matt? Good afternoon, sir. The city council, make sure you're looking happy on a, on a gray day. <laughs> uh, my name is Nicholas Whitehead. I'm uh, a former member of the United Nations Association, <clears throat> which, uh, of course, the United Nations always uh, promotes very serious civil rights and individual liberties. Um, the city is <clears throat> a signatory way back, decades back, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is not a document that governments can formally sign on to, but um, we did agree as a city to follow the, the outlines uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so I'm making the same kind of plea that the lady from Santa Cruz Cares did. Be very, very cautious about the amount of authority that is given to centralized government. That, that is a position that should disturb uh, libertarians as well as social progressives. Um, I'm not saying that nobody should be detained if they're a, a real serious danger. Um, society from time to time has to have those powers, but let's make it really serious if we're going to incarcerate people, okay? Um, I, I do attend meetings of the... Uh, Mental Health Advisory Board of the county. So uh, I follow those, and they're a very good, excellent group of people. I just want you to know. Um, thanks for allowing me to testify. Mr. Whitehead, thank you, sir. Anyone else who's with us wish to comment on this item? Matter is back for, before the council. Is there a motion? I'll move. Motion to adopt the recommendation. Motion by Member Kalantari Johnson, second by Ms. Bruner. I'll second. Under discussion, debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. Just a comment, um, <clears throat> just briefly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to say that um, I, this is a really serious issue in our, um, in our community and, and communities throughout the, the country, really in the world. And, um, and I do see the need for um, new tools and um, I think more importantly resources to address um, the really grave impacts that we see in our community um, related to behavioral health issues, uh, people who are experiencing uh, challenges as well as um, their families, uh, <laughs> their um, friends, neighbors, and our community at, at large. Um, I'm, but I'm not prepared to support these bills today or, or direct uh, that, that we uh, sign on in support um, on civil rights grounds, but also um, for practical reasons that I just want to share really quickly. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that um, nothing about this legislation uh, provides any additional resources to actually accomplish the goal here. and. Um, it ha there is the requisite language in the bill. I've read it. I've talked with people about it, um, you know, about reimbursement for local costs. But those of us who have been around um, local government uh, or paying attention to, you know, the services funding, uh, public funding, know that what we get end up with are unfunded mandates. And so I'm very concerned that um, this is another tool that we aren't going to really be able to use effectively um, and really make it even less likely to be implemented appropriately without funding. What we need is uh, siting for facilities and staffing for facilities um, for uh, if, if people need care, um, we just don't have, there's, there just aren't resources available. So um, creating a system to force it with nowhere for people to really go, um, at least you know, it doesn't appear to be um, very easy to make that, that work. Um, a statewide database, yes, um, but that just means trying to shuffle people around the state. Um, it, it doesn't seem to me to be an effective way to provide care and get people well. Um, so I, I can't support it today, and I just wanted to explain why, um, but I'm, 
you know, I, I do think we some, something's got to give, and, and let's get the state to help fund it. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kalatari Johnson, then Council Member Bruner. Uh, thank you for those comments. I agree with a lot of what you said, Council Member Brown, um, and something's got to give, and what we're doing right now is not working. Um, and I actually would like to comment that I think we should uh, ask the county to look at this. Um, this is where the, it lives. It lives within the county to address mental health, um, unmet mental health needs, and, and people, I, we all know people in our community are suffering. I think this is um, an, the intention and a step towards addressing those gaps that a lot of our communities have throughout the state. Um, there are gaps within this bill, but it's a step in the right direction. And I don't know how helpful it would be, but perhaps we can add to the letter that the mayor is going to write that we urge that there is funding, um, that, that the legislator, state legislators look at the funding scheme for implementation. Any objection to that? All right. When we get around to the actual motion, that will be incorporated by reference. Council Member Brenner. Thank you. Um, Thank you to the public who shared their comments and um, thank you Council Member Brown for your comments as well. And um, I think, you know, a couple things that um, for me, um, this SB, we have two separate bills that are kind of together here. So I'll speak to SB 43 um, being that, um, this is an expansion of the definition of gravely disabled, and my understanding is that it um, it would include conditions that um, have to do with a person's kind of serious harm to physical or mental health. And um, I think um, I read that this update to California's conservatorship law is was originally in 1960s and um, <clears throat> and it's been difficult to provide treatment to individuals um, um, because of that and um, and then there's also all kinds of information about when um, health conditions exist um, then appropriate supports and services are given earlier um, that there's less kind of disabling and um, fewer adverse outcomes um, because of that. And um, knowing, like I mentioned earlier, since last year, Senator Edmond has brought forward this, and she is a clinical social worker and um, has been doing a lot of work on um, um, these bills, there's a series of bills in the larger picture that are aiming to support behavioral health reform in, in our state that hasn't been done. And um, we see all the gaps. And while this is not something that is a city department that we directly um, oversee or control, um, and these bills still have a long way to go, they're in process and they may not even make it, but having the city's support um, along the way is relevant, and um, um, I just I would I just wanted to say that. So yeah, we have to kind of look at all the 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 factors and um, and look at ways of um, really updating how our our state responds to some of the needs that. Are exist so thank you council member further on this item the motion would be in order motion to approve the recommendation with the additional I, direction from oh. council member Colin Tari Johnson so I'll I can amend the motion uh, uh, let me just see if I can get it right okay so this would be the staff recommendation is the motion with the additional direction that you are adding uh, in the letter that I would be authorized to send to the legislature saying that we uh, also support sufficient appropriations to implement the bill. Right. Very good. Okay, that will so be both the letters. Yes. And, and I think also I'll, uh, I'd like to add um, uh, directing staff to communicate with the county to consider these bills as well. 
Okay, very good. Without objection, such will be the order. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Can I just see who the, confirm who the first and second one? I have Palantari, Johnson, and Bruner. Yes. All right, okay. Yeah, we'll go with that. Mm -hmm. No, no, Ms. Brown's going to be voting against the motion. Okay, so we we are clear. We have a motion, a second. We have additional direction. Without objection, we will go to a roll call vote. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Alan Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are on item number 24. This is the city's legislative program and platform. We welcome Ms. Wise West. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Just one moment while I bring up. Certainly. Thank you. Good to go. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon once again, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Tiffany Wisewest, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager, and I'm here to present to you today a brief presentation on the 2023 legislative program and platform, which has really historically served as a compass uh, for active legislation, uh, but could be leveraged for other purposes. Um, this legislative pro, uh, platform is a guiding document that was updated from 2022, uh, which was uh, prepared by uh, our communications uh, manager in the past, and was largely based on the priorities that were articulated in the city's COVID-19 uh, recovery plan called Re-Envision Santa Cruz. Um, and I understand that there is strategic planning going on and subsequent uh, legislative platforms and programs we will, of course, revise this based on that uh, strategic planning and uh, direction. Um, this also reflects other local ordinances and legislation uh, priorities that um, this body has undertaken over time. Um, also, I believe Chris Giglio, who is our federal advocate, is also here today. And really, as he said um, last year, in a sense, acts as an extension of our staff, really keeping us abreast of uh, DC opportunities, timelines, and, and so forth. Okay, um, so the legislative program really establishes the principles that will guide the city's policy and legislative advocacy efforts at the regional, state, and federal level. Um, it focuses on key areas that will enable the city to deliver um, its projects and programs that meets our community's needs. Um, it serves as a reference to guide the development of positions on legislative proposals and provides guidance for council and staff throughout the year on process. Uh, within the legislative uh, platform, it streamlines the position taking uh, process by providing our staff and our contracted uh, government relations representatives with clear direction to advocate on these matters. Um, it helps to ensure we have a timely response as to do we want to support, oppose, or take neutral positions on legislation that could impact the city's ability to operate efficiently. Um, it also conveys to legislators, policymakers, and the public where the city stands on important policy issues and legislative discussions. Uh, additionally, staff or council may recommend platform amendments during the year to add, remove, or modify language if unanticipated leg legislative issues arise. So uh, the result of our efforts in 2022 included uh, 4.4 million uh, in congressionally directed spending uh, funding requests from Congressman Panetta's office. Um, however, this past year we did not advance any state uh, sponsored, state level sponsored legislation and thus have nothing to report on that front. But you can see these three projects we were very successful um, and Congressman Panetta's allocations uh, to us. In terms of the platform itself, really the guiding principles, again, these are the same principles that we've had uh, since our COVID recovery with one exception. And I will highlight for you throughout this presentation 
where things differed from the 2020 true legislation. And in fact, you can see bolded um, on this list, advanced work to address critical infrastructure issues is a new priority this year that we have added. I think um, it's obvious uh, from the water presentation earlier today to the capital improvement program budget to um, the impacts of our extreme storms that infrastructure must be a critical focus um, here. I will also mention that um, you note uh, promote healthy, equitable, sustainable, and climate adapted communities. We did add those words climate adapted. There's so much more focus that we are making as uh, the water department director mentioned, lots of work on their end um, and lots of work in general, particularly with the climate adaptation plan update um, uh, starting this year. In terms of our four legislative priorities uh, that we have in place, um, several key factors drove kind of why these uh, legislative uh, priorities are continuing. Number one, the city's challenge in implementing its first comprehensive homelessness response action plan adopted in 2021. The recent adoption of the Securing Our uh, Water Future Council policy that was adopted. Um, the recent adoption of the Climate Action Plan 2030 and its implementation work plan. And number four, the damages sustained uh, by the January 2023 bomb cyclone event. So key drivers here. In terms of infrastructure, um, this really includes transportation, water ecosystem uh, projects, water resiliency projects, flood control, parks development and maintenance, and so on. Notably, we have well over $75 million in federal grants pending right now um, for infrastructure needs. Um, and those uh, at the requested department heads in the review of this um, document, they requested that we include in their example projects for infrastructure and some of the other priorities, as well as a list of some of these uh, funding, uh, federal funding opportunities that are, that are pending. And those include a number from FEMA and other uh, federal agencies. In terms of our engagement strategies, um, again, this is everything that could focus from uh, focus on direct engagement to building coalitions and state and federal agency connections. Um, so this is really how how do we go about this? And and your prior item is obviously one of the examples of of how to do so. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's happening here with this, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention here in, in terms of building coalitions, um, I know we've referenced in the past um, our work with Santa Monica to understand how they addressed sidewalk vending, for example. On our local level with climate, we have our new regional climate project working group, um, as well as other climate uh, related uh, collaboratives um, on both the regional and the state level. And in fact, actually the, uh, the federal level as well. Um, and I wanted to update you on our 2023 um, congressionally directed spending, re spending requests that we recently made um, that are in alignment with our priorities. Um, number one, uh, the Westcliff Drive uh, Mitchell's Cove seawall design was submitted to Senators Padilla, Feinstein, and Cro uh, Congressman Panetta. So we requested $2 million of the $4 million cost for that project. Um, we also submitted um, a $500,000 request for design of the Homeless Navigation Center to uh, Senator Feinstein and Congressman Panetta. And then finally, for the Brackney Slide uh, pipeline replacement, that's a water pipeline, um, we asked, it, asked for $1 million of about a $7 to $8 million uh, project from uh, Congressman Panetta and uh, Senator Feinstein. Um, it's really important to note that whether or not these federal earmarks go forward is still really uncertain at this time. I mean, if we would even get chosen uh, for those. And our federal advocate, Chris Gila, can talk more about this if you're interested. Of course, with the um, Infrastructure Investment Act and Jobs Act, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of opportunities out there. We've been working with grant writers that we have brought in and under contract to go after some of this funding. Um, in fact, 16 million last year was done with that grant writing um, assistance. So getting towards the end here, um, key California deadlines that you may be interested in. We did just receive the full slate of bills in current session a couple weeks ago from um, our state advocacy uh, advocate, Gualco, and we are in the process of identifying, we have identified already some, 
legislation that we will be tracking at the state level. Um, and in addition to those that support our priorities, I know, for example, last year, uh, Council Member Brown, you mentioned in the past an interest in keeping an eye on bills that uh, perhaps usurp uh, local control, or as was mentioned previously, um, those that may have unfunded mandates. So we, d we have our eye on those in addition to our priorities. Um, so just really briefly, um, <clears throat> May 19th is the, the last day uh, for, uh, is a deadline for uh, the fiscal committee to meet, May 12th for the policy committee. Um, those bills will come out of uh, House of Origin by June 2nd. Um, of all those legislative bills we're tracking, they'll be whittled down at that point. Um, all bills will need to be finished by September 14th, and October 14th is the last day for the governor to sign a veto or veto here in California. Of course, the full uh, timeline is contained in the uh, program and platform document that you have if you are interested. So with that, um, I want to first mention before um, we get to the, the recommended action that approving this doesn't preclude you from bringing items to council to support other priorities throughout the year. Um, this is really a starting point, and our advocacy is at your direction and discretion, and I think that's really important to emphasize. Um, lastly, I welcome your engagement. We welcome your engagement in any of this, whether today or ongoing, and I'm here to answer any questions um, that you may have and perhaps might need to draw on Chris or even Matt for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wisewes. We very much appreciate that. Let me see if there are questions by... All I gotta do is put that up. There we go, Ms. Kalantar Johnson. Gotta get used to the new system I know. here. It's, it's gonna take a minute. Thank you, Tiffany, for the presentation and the work on this. Um, I'm sorry if you, if you mentioned this. When do we hear about the earmarks? And, and how does that play into um, our planning for our budget? I don't think that it is considered in our budget. I know for the most part, our budget goes forward now with funded um, projects only, not unfunded projects. Um, so that answers that piece. In terms of when we should hear, um, I'm, I'm actually not 100% sure on that. I, Matt, do you, do you know on that? Um, it's unlikely that we'll have a response back um, in time for us to build in those assumptions as part of the budget. We'll likely hear uh, later this uh, this fall of whether or not we were successful on those applications. So uh, more to come, and uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Thank you. Further questions, comments? I would have a couple on this. Uh, some go to form, some go to substance. And let me start by saying... Dr. Wise West, as I understand it, you inherited both the form of this and the process that has been used customarily by the city. Yes, it's so correct. I want to I want to separate essentially your work product out from how this has been done in the past. I'm going to separate those out. Uh, as to form, I think that it would be quite helpful if we had these conversations in the latter part of the calendar year so that when so that we would be able to adopt a legislative program before the legislature goes back into session in January each year so rather than bringing this in the spring of the year my thought is bring it in the fall of the year uh, because we'll know two things. One is in the first year of the legislative session, uh, we will know by the end of that what we got done, what we didn't get done, and we'll be able to uh, know that and react accordingly in the second year of the two-year session. And I'm speaking solely of the state legislative component of this, not to the federal component of this. So I think one change we want to make, I've discussed this with Mr. Huffker, we've had sort of a bit of a side conversation uh, with Dr. Wise West on this. So as to form, I think we should change the timing of getting this document in front of us, because by now having it in front of us in the latter part of March, the deadline for bill introductions was in February. So we're not going to get any bills. Anything we want in legislative bills, we're going to have to seek amendments to existing bills rather than having a bill introduced in a timely manner that we're looking for. Secondly, I 
hope that we will remember that we have actually two members of Congress that represent portions of Santa Cruz County, and not to forget Congress Member Anna Eshoo's component part, who will then be able to assist us in prosecuting our federal agenda. Uh, additionally, I think that it may be worth, and, and, and Mr. Huffaker and Dr. Weiswes and I are going to be talking more about this uh, in the next few weeks, uh, and that is that although, and again, Dr. Wise West has inherited this, uh, it seems to me that in reading this, the impact or the punch of what we want to get done is so diffused uh, as to not be recognizable with regard to what in fact are the city's highest priorities. And I want to separate out the, the concept of applying for grants and that kind of thing, budget appropriations or moves that we want to make in the state legislature relative to budget uh, and grant applications at the state level. Again, I'm not going to speak to the federal level. It's not something I have any familiarity with, but I do have a bit of a familiarity with, with the state legislative process, both budgetary and, and, and non-budgetary legislation. So I think focusing this down to uh, three to five high priorities that we can get consensus on and focus like a laser beam on those three to five priorities is going to serve us better than a very large document that, ex that essentially tries to address too much, I think, and loses the punch of a higher prioritizing of what we really want to get done. For example, Dr. Wise West works on, as we know, our, our, our climate uh, change and adaptation program. Well, if that's really important to us, let's identify two or three things we want to get done on that and then go at those like a laser beam. Uh, we have other priorities. Homelessness and housing are high priorities for us as well as a council. Uh, we are going to want to get into conversations much earlier than this scheduling of the program allows us to get into right now. So those are my comments and observations. Let me ask, I've asked council members if they had any, we have now completed those. Let me go to the public and see if anyone's who's, excuse me? I have one. Certainly, go ahead. I know in the past, if I just, it just dawned on me, in the past we had talked about like cities also having advocacy, for example, coastal communities that are experiencing similar type issues. I'm wondering how that fits into our legislative agenda. It's been a discussion point over the years, or if it could be. I'll speak just briefly to that. I know that there's interest in developing that for in particular homelessness and that there's some activity towards that. I did already mention, um, for example, the Central Coast Climate Collaborative. Um, I don't know if the city manager has anything else that he, he might want to mention regarding uh, like cities and, and advocacy together. Uh, yeah, uh, just a quick response to that. I appreciate the question, uh, Councilmember Watkins. Um, on the homelessness response front, one of the items in uh, the homelessness response action plan included building out a coastal communities coalition. And so just over the last few months, staff have completed an RFP to hire uh, a lobbyist advocacy group that specializes in this area. We actually uh, hope to close that contract within the next couple of weeks, and that'll be one of the major efforts over uh, the course of, of this next year. Um, I would also just note that um, just this past week, we also heard from Senator Laird's office that they've formed a Central Coast Caucus with our powerhouse local delegation, and I, I think there's certainly some opportunities for us to leverage that um, as well. And when it comes to the platform, um, as, as we move forward um, and we, we kind of hone in and we focus uh, what priorities we want to really uh, put our attention into this year, I think we could also build out some, some more explicit uh, language around how we're building coalitions on, uh, on uh, common interests. Great. Yeah, I'd like to see that move forward if possible. I think there's power in numbers to see some of these big issues um, addressed in other communities besides Santa Cruz. Very good. Good afternoon. I suspect you are lining up to testify on this item or provide input. Please come forward and do so. Ms. Bush, while the gentleman's coming forward, do we have anyone online? We do, yeah. We will. We'll alternate then. Good afternoon again, sir. 
It's great to be here. I still have yet to comment on 25 and 26, but uh, how about I comment on 24? I'm sorry, excuse me? Oh. Say that I, again. I, I'm going to give the whole board a compliment, and since I've last been here, you guys are actually presenting information in much greater brevity. Oh, <laughs> now I get it. Uh, I'm slow sometimes. So, um, as far as, you know, this, this small corporation's funding and stuff, you know, nobody's mentioning what's going on with the banks the past couple of weeks and the controlled slowdown. You know, empires only last about 150 years, and this one was really established on February 23rd, 1871. You can do the math. It's a couple of years overdue. But as far as what's going on with the finances and stuff, you guys still keep mentioning those sustainability, New World Order stuff. So let's just open the conversation a little bit. This is from the Wall Street Journal, Thursday, April 23rd. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, engage me for just a second. Yes. Just for a second. So we are on item 24, the city's about legislative the program. Legislative. Aren't, you are going to speak to that, is that Absolutely. Correct? Wonderful. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, because I'm just trying to suggest and provide information that you guys are reading from scripts like yesterday didn't happen and these situations haven't been planned for many decades. So it doesn't seem like nothing, anything's been mentioned so far and I still don't have a time on that. As far as what's going on with the banking debacles, that's going to affect everything in this city as well. So. <clears throat> I can understand that you're trying to limit my scope of what I'm talking about, but once again, I'm going to continue. Well, excuse me. Ha yes. Hang on just a second. And this won't come out of your time. Well, okay. Okay. I just want to make sure we're clear on this. I was simply seeking clarification as to what you were testifying. I'm not trying to limit your comments. So okay. let's be very clear with each other. That's not what I am trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that you're addressing the item that you, I was asked, excuse me, that is in front of us right now. And as to the clock, my comments won't come off of your time. Please proceed. Okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm wrong all the time. But this is going over the 2023 prospective budget, right? It says right on here, 2023 legislative program and platform CM. You guys keep mentioning the sustainability subjects and stuff. Why don't you proceed? Go ahead. Take your you time and proceed. I'm doing Do whatever my best. it is you wish to say, go ahead and say it. Okay, so, you know, what's really going to happen when, for lack of better words, the poop hits the fan? These situations have been planned for quite a long time. So, once again, Wall Street Journal, Thursday, April 22nd, 1982. How I learned to love the New World Order. Counterpoint by Joseph R. Biden, Jr. So we can just kind of jump up to the sustainability stuff. This is an article from 1998. This is another article from 1998. The Agenda 21 came into this county in 1993 through the SEEDS project, and in 1997 was established. So you guys are basically just reading scripts. So it's just an opportunity to present that information. I'm going to comment later. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who's with us wish to comment? on item 24 online. Let's go with that, Ms. Bush. Good afternoon. Yes, hello. Hey, I'll put it to you most simply, what is wrong with ambitious, radical, ideologically driven activists, social justice warrior, unelected bureaucrats who are beyond the reach of the people making vast policy advocacy recommendations is that they are radically, ideologically driven activists, unaccountable, no skin in the game, unelected bureaucrats, social justice warriors beyond the reach of the people making vast policy advocacy recommendations instead of possibly lazy politicians doing what they are supposed to be doing instead of rubber stamping documents such as this and instead making their own specific legislation recommendations as objective public proxy while hearing public concerns that are within the scope of a small city government and not going off on a crusade attempting to fix world problems beyond their scope, pay grade, and ability. Yes, I'm leery of far too many to mention doom-headed directives here that desire to turn Santa Cruz into a nonprofit welfare nanny state with a Statue of Liberty Section 8 economy of the poor or the advocacy in any way of these defective socialist equity narratives whatsoever 
or accept the blinders on risk ignorant totalitarian advocacy such as quote eliminate natural gas use or co-opting fees such as utility fees or phony impact fees for any purpose other than providing related services such as utilities because the city is a monopoly. This is largely a delegation of legislative advocacy that should be different than my condo's eerily similar amateur hour condo board okaying every idea contract and bid by the hired property manager. Past policy expressed by past council aren't really licensed to end around the current council on new legislative matters. The same sand hugger, ideologically driven people with misguided priorities brought you the West Cliff Management Adaptation Plan, the only managing of which managed to drop a block of West Cliff Drive into the Pacific Ocean. Seems to me our electrical grid has been going out a lot lately, so please wait until I die before trying to pry my reliable natural gas out of my dead cold hands before doing your blinders on electrification ideas. I doubt you can explain how that policy is what I need, want, and I'm willing to pay for, or that it doesn't deprive me of liberty and pursuit of happiness, or that has any kind of a promise to deliver anything to anyone with any tangible benefit whatsoever while blind to the risks and costs. The Legislative Action Manual is a delegation funnel of unelected bureaucratic advocacy through the city manager for a mayoral rubber stamp. The motivations expressed in this document are those of a select few in the city government, and I note only a couple of references to the word people, except only as homeless or low income. Note in the role of the city manager's office or the guidelines for evaluating legislation or an independent lobbying by city personnel, none include even one reference to getting a public people consensus input. I'm against pre-approving any government relations consultants in contact with higher legislative bodies advocating non-specific dogma outside the observance and pervasive agreement of the people. This ain't the DNC convention party. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Good afternoon. Hello. Um, yes, I, we can hear you and proceed to hear me. Um, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I mean, I don't know where to begin. I think the idea of local government coordinating on uh, higher levels of government in order to enact meaningful policy can be a good thing. Um, I just, when I see, uh, like in the previous item, a simple letter of support for basically the increased um, loss of autonomy of people who have substance abuse issues get commented on by community members who are in the comments universally against it and then be told, well, it doesn't matter, the letter's not that important, and then see this, which clearly this is a substantial effort to you know lobby at the state level for policies, to coordinate on state level policy and county level policy, and then and to do that as representatives while also ignoring all of your public comment, I mean you couldn't even just not send a letter, which you know, and now we're talking about funding streams and like policy that affects wide swaths of people. Uh, it's, you know, it's very concerning because I don't get the sense that uh, there's a lot of democratic accountability here. Um, and I don't get the sense that, uh, you know, there's much concern for people's civil rights. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I just, I would like you to, um, I don't know, take this responsibility more seriously if you're going to do it because, um, you know, this could be your family members getting locked up or uh, having a, you know, a hangout at the Catalyst one night. And this is serious stuff. This is serious stuff when you increase the criminalization of people 
And when you uh, take state funding and focus it in these like harmful ways. So, yeah. Thank you for calling in. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, are you on this item, sir? Testifying on this item? Okay, thank you. Anyone else in chambers wish to make a comment on this item? Ms. Bush, do we have others online? Matters back before the council for an action. I'll move the, I'll move the recommendation and incorporate uh, Mayor Keeley's input around timing changes and structure that way. Does that capture? aspects that you'd like to see let me see if I can expand on that a bit Please. so the motion would be to approve the staff recommendation to add additional direction that with regard to timing of presenting the legislative program to the council that that be done in the fall of each year and with regard to scope that the report focuses in on three and no more than five priority issues. Would that be all right with you as the maker of the motion? That is all right with me, and I'm just wondering and looking okay. to staff if they have any input on the constraints within the three to five, or concern. I'm a big fan of focusing uh, the work we're doing around <laughs> advocacy. Um, I will say that that would not prohibit us continuing to pursue as Tiffany mentioned, other areas of priority that the council has taken policy positions on. Absolutely. So our, you know, our, our thought is that uh, next year we can um, pull together um, um, a study session to kind of talk through what that would be, how best to approach that work, and really hone in um, the platform. Perfect. Okay. okay. Great. I'll accept that. Then. Ms. Kalatari Johnson. I was going to second. A second to that motion with its uh, additions. Anyone else under debate or discussion? Thank you for this report, Dr. Weiss-West. It's very, very helpful. It's also uh, thank you for uh, and the city manager for the opportunity to rethink perhaps how we might be doing this uh, going forward with some greater focus to it. Let me say that a, someone made a brief comment. I'm not sure who, but someone made a comment about our powerhouse delegation at the state level. And I just want to say, so the public recognizes this, uh, we are the mouse that roared in a sense. And that is, Senator Laird is, it's a 40 member body and Senator Laird is by any measure, one of the top three or four most effective legislators in the California State Senate. I think he is very likely to become the next president pro tem of the Senate. We have two new assembly members, uh, Ms. Pellerin and, and uh, Ms. Addis, uh, who share representing uh, our county. Uh, and both of them just started their what will likely be 12-year runs in the, in the California State Legislature. Additionally, a very small part of our county is represented by Assemblymember Robert Rivas. Uh, Mr. Rivas, unless things go haywire in Sacramento, which we know doesn't ever happen, uh, is very likely as of July the 1st of this year to become the new Speaker of the California State Assembly. Think about that for a moment. President pro tem of the Senate, Speaker of the Assembly, two additional Assembly members representing the County of Santa Cruz. And I will tell you, they don't distinguish between, well, I only represent from Live Oak down to here. I don't really represent this. They all believe that they represent all of this in, in a highly general way. And they're all approachable. And I think that it is very true. Whoever made that statement about our powerhouse delegation has a, has a good sense of what that means. I think by amending how we do this process and what's contained in it, it'll also give them great clarity as they are being asked each year, here's, your, here's the 30 bills I'm going to introduce. They're going to get far more than 30 requests for bills. So for us to get in early 
with clear identification of the kind of bills we need, which will help prosecute our public policy agenda is going to be, I think, quite helpful with that powerhouse delegation. Thank you again, Dr. Wise West. Thank you, Mr. Huffaker. Thanks to all the departments who participated in putting this document together. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item number 25. This is the military equipment purchase request and policy update per Assembly Bill 481. Chief, good afternoon. Always good to see you, sir. Thanks to you and your staff for all of your constant and good work. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Josh Trog. I'm a detective sergeant with the uh, Santa Cruz Police Department. Welcome this afternoon, and thank you for your good work. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will be providing a presentation on our request to purchase a new robot. And for the Council's information, I have brought our current robot with us. Should anyone wish to see it, look at it, hold it, um, I can do that now before I get into my presentation, or I can do it at the end, at the council's pleasure. We will accede to how you want to proceed. Go ahead. If it's okay, I'll just break it out so that sure. everyone can pass it around and look at it, and then okay. it might lead to other questions. All right. So this is just the robot. As a remote, I'm happy to turn it on and run it around chambers if so desired, but I thought I'd just start by passing it. For a bit of background, the state legislature enacted AB 41. It became effective January 1 of 2022, and it established requirements for police departments to uh, keep, maintain, and acquire items that were deemed as military equipment for the purposes of the Assembly Bill. Uh, in pursuant to that, the department is requesting to purchase a new robot and to comply with the mandate set forth by the assembly bill and council, uh, I'm here to present on that. Uh, what we will be asking for is the permission to purchase a new robot, as I've mentioned, and an amendment to our existing policy, uh, policy 705, our military equipment policy, uh, that relates to uh, all of the items that we have in our possession. Next slide, please. This is just a little background on what is covered under the military equipment policy. The main points related to the acquisition, request for acquisition for a robot, uh, we would be requesting amendments to the quantity and capabilities portions because we would be adding a robot to our existing uh, equipment list. And the new version of the robot has some different capabilities than the current one, which I will speak about. Uh, as we go along. Next slide, please. So our current robot, which I've passed around, is called the Throwbot. Uh, it resides in Category 1 of the military equipment list. Um, it is a little remote-controlled camera. Uh, it has uh, some capabilities for low-light usage. Uh, it has creates its own infrared light in low or no-light situations to allow the camera to be useful. Um, it has a decent range. Its range is limited by uh, building type and construction. Uh, 
large metal buildings tend to interfere with its reception and range. Um, this one is nearing the end of its service life. It is 10 years old. Uh, we've had the battery pack replaced once. Uh, that impacts its, uh, its uh, one-time usage in between charges. Um, it's just getting old. Um, it has no audio capabilities. Um, and the, the updated version has some new uh, capabilities that we like. Um, the important thing to consider about this robot is what this thing does for us is, is allows us to put an inan inanimate object into a place that could be dangerous before we put officers into that position. Um, it is a very good de-escalation tool because it provides us with information on what could be waiting in that room, in that corner, down that dark hallway. Um, it can allow us to create plans to further de-escalate and mitigate the need for higher levels of use of force uh, based on the information that the camera in the robot provides. It can give us the location of hostages, armed persons, injured persons, uh, any number of scenarios where it can be put in uh, and used. Uh, it can be thrown. It's actually quite robust, um, so it's helpful. You, you may. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it is quite robust. It you may thrown. not. <laughs> We've thrown it upstairs. Uh, we've thrown it across, you know, parking lots into warehouse buildings. Um, uh, in, in actual law enforcement operations, I've tossed it up two flights of stairs. Um, and it runs, it writes itself and it runs. Um, so it is a very useful tool for the police department. Next slide, please. So this slide is a indication of the upgrades to the new robot that we are requesting. Uh, they've increased the battery runtime to approximately 110 minutes, which is significant. Uh, they've done some uh, improvements to its dust and water resistance capabilities. Um, those things, we don't submerge the robot, uh, but uh, it, it can, you know, withstand being out in the weather like today's rainy weather mm -hmm. a little bit longer than the older robot and obviously dust considerations and are, are any improvements to that are good just as a matter of course. Um, it can be thrown 120 feet. It can withstand repeated 30-foot drops. Uh, they've increased the range um, for video and audio, which is a component of the new robot, is it has one-way audio transmission now. The current one does not. It's video only. The new one has the ability to receive audio, uh, which is, in my opinion, a game changer when it comes to information gathering and de-escalation. If we can see and hear, we are that much more improved on the information that we have in whatever situation we are dealing with. Um, the uh, range increased to 150 feet indoors, uh, 50 feet, 450 feet outdoors, um, and with line of sight increases the ability, uh, its range abilities even indoors. So if there's a large window and you're outdoors, that helps increase the range. Uh, of the device. Uh, it has the same uh, day and night operation capabilities as this one, um, just improved cameras and low light uh, capabilities. The cost for the device is $16,270. That funding is achieved through a... This might say that in part is why you can't throw it around. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, The Money for that is achieved through a Homeland Security grant that we obtained five years ago. Uh, so there is no anticipated cost to the city through department budget or general fund. Next slide, please. That is the end. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or if any clarification is needed. Sergeant, thank you for your presentation. Let me see if there are members who have questions or comments on this. Other members of the public who would like to make comments on this item, please proceed. Come forward, provide your input on this. Good afternoon, sir.
My name is Lee Brokaw. I'm chairman of the Police Accountability and Transparency Committee for the local board of the ACLU, and I speak personally, not for the ACLU. Um, I have no problem with this robot. Okay, no problem. I'm concerned about the process. This is the first piece of a military equipment that law enforcement is asking this body to approve. It was not presented in a standalone request. It was added to policy 705, which was crafted by Lexapol on February 10th of 23. And it is inter intermingled with the Throbot 1 and the Avatar stair climbing robot. And it, it has wording problems where the statement says Throbot 2 SB SCPD wishes to purchase. And then it says in the text, this equipment has been used in numerous high risk and dangerous situations. You haven't got it yet. So I have problems with wording and words matter. We could be talking about a tripod mounted belt fired machine gun, which Santa Clara County owns and San Diego County Sheriff owns. This is simple right now. It's important that process be established so that it doesn't set precedent for future requests. The upset in the community over the Bearcat set a precedent that makes it very difficult for law enforcement to want to buy more military equipment because we in the community don't want this city to look like a military occupied zone. Um, under the Avatar 2, you wouldn't expect to find something like this, but it says entirely owned and operated by Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office personnel. And that is followed by the statement, SCPD Emergency Service Unit, ESU Tactical Team, has primary control over the Throbot. Well, why are we talking about the Throbot in the section that's about the Avatar 2? It's like talking about a Volkswagen when you got a John Deere. Um, so I would encourage you to have future requests for equipment come in a standalone request for equipment to be added to the policy at the time of approval, as opposed to be added to the policy in advance of approval. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We're going to alternate back and forth. Thank you very much. Uh, the person online is now recognized. Good afternoon. Hello, this is Jasmine Mia again. I just have a brief comment. I want to point out that, um, as was said in the presentation, the new Throbot has audio capabilities and the old one did not. So um, I just want to ensure that SCPD can't use that in court as admissible evidence since people won't know they're being audio recorded. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon once again, uh, city council members, mayor and vice mayor. My name is Rhonda Reyna, and I'm just stating my objection to the Santa Cruz Police Department to have any kind of military equipment. I don't know if any of you are actually paying attention your to your constituents. You are elected, and I'm not feeling like you're representing our viewpoint as evidenced by your behavior and the decision you made on item 14. But if you look at any social media and have conversations with your constituents, they do not trust this police department, and they have a lot of reason not to trust the men of this police department. We repeatedly heard de-escalate, de-escalate. That's a false, fabricated statement. And allow me to remind you how this police department de-escalates situations. We've got Officer David Didi wrenching my 13-year-old daughter's arm, who was the victim of violence by her dad. Is that de-escalation? We have Ruben Badeo, George Floyding my daughter, kneeling on her neck. Is that de-escalation? Then we have David Didi standing on the shackles, dogpiling my daughter. On another incident, we have cops, including Ruben Badeo, 
standing by watching a young lady get stripped naked and violently shoved into a car. So I find it completely hypocritical to hear them asking you to spend my taxpayers' money on a new military weapon that they're inevitably going to want to use against we the people. They're not providing safety. How is this going to keep the children safe? It's not. And it, it's, just, it's just shameful and disgraceful. And I know you're going to ignore me because just as you did in item 14 and everything else, I, you know, I guess I'm just a member here learning how politics works, that nobody seems to care, that children are being harmed, that the homeless are being picked on, that disabled people are being picked on. And I thought we elected representatives. Is there something I'm not understanding? How do I get my viewpoint represented? How do, when do you guys ever say no? I say no new toys for bad boys. Thank you. Next person online. Uh, we have no more. No one else. Good afternoon, sir. Hello again. My name is James Ewing Whitman. So this is about Assembly Bill 481, and on this bi-monthly meeting, that's 44 pages. So I'm assuming that I can comment on anything on those 44 pages. Right? Okay, I've spoken several times uh, after Jim Hart has spoken about this bill, and um, I've spoken when this law enforcement was in the room and when Andy Mills was in the room. You know, the only individuals that are getting thrown under the bus more than teachers, children, or law enforcement. You know, if any law enforcement wants some information on how they can pr protect themselves from these weapons that are designed so you will not live through retirement, and I'm talking about the wireless devices that you wear on your body. It is actually very easy to shield from that, and it doesn't cost very much money. So this agenda item has uh, 44 pages on page 25, on, on page 6, under the different military weapons. Two thirds down, it says, Tasers, shockwave, microwave weapons, water cannons, and long-range acoustical devices. Let's focus on the microwave weapons. Since 1996, I think it's FCC 704, the only complaint people can make is about the way these weapons look. I've suggested that the citizens get together and sue this city for $250 million. Um, but yesterday's already happened. What are we going to do today? There's a lot we can do to help each other, but we kind of need some cold water splashed on our face about what's really going on in the various elephants that are in the room. So I can make some specific, uh, one can find some information from Barry Trowler. There were, other, there were over 13,000 law enforcement that were tested. Some of them started to have extreme reactions at nine months. 30% of them had extreme reactions in 18 months. Um, I forgot my phone, I forgot my notebook with my notes while so I'm just talking. But I'm saying it because I'm concerned and, you know, without law enforcement, we don't have laws. Law enforcement's been replaced by the street lights and the frequency weapons for a long time. Individuals like Mark Steele have talked about that. We have plug and play technology everywhere. You know, I did some research, I looked at the plans, it used to be easier. Now I was told, oh, we lost him, if we ever find him, we'll let you know. But um, 90% of the commercial streetlights are owned and operated by PG&E, and that's a Rothschild's company. There's a lot of information, and there's a lot of elephants in the room that aren't being talked about. I care enough to speak publicly about it, because I care about the future. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. You do. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's a uh, it's pretty interesting uh, drone bot doodad gadget thing. Um, I, I don't know, you know, like sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the old fashioned way uh, to uh, surveil uh, seems superior to something that wouldn't last, uh, its battery life wouldn't last uh, one of these meetings. Uh, I, I actually, I want one. I'm looking at it and go like that. That would be fun to have. Um, uh, you know, mean, meanwhile, um, um, if it was used in uh, certain circumstances, it would certainly be considered drone surveillance, um, 
which, uh, as, as one caller mentioned, uh, is uh, totally inadmissible uh, as evidence in court, courts of law. Um, so there's limitations on, you know, what you're getting for your $16,000. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly interesting. Um, I, I object to the, uh, the airspace uh, violations of, uh, of surveillance drones at the beach. I go to the beach and I see this blinking green light and the city has no problem with that. Well, um, you know, this is, this is obviously intended just for desperate situations, just uh, uh, circumstances where uh, you've, got, uh, uh, you've, got, uh, you've got areas you can't enter and you need to, uh, you need to have information. Uh, um, uh, the microphone's a little, it's kind of creepy, you know, like it could be used wrongfully. And it certainly would open the city up to lawsuits. Thank you. Well, thank you. I am now advised that we have two folks who have joined us online. We're going to go back and forth. We'll take one here, then you, then we'll go back again online. Online. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council members. Here, I'm, I'm Ron Pomerantz, and um, I, I'm brief today on this, but I, I am concerned because the adage, uh, less is better, fits the use of military equipment as far as uh, I'm concerned and my membership in the ACLU is. So uh, questions I would like to see answered prior to uh, approval tonight would be, how many times has the current throwbot been used in emergencies over the past 10 years. How much training has been done with this piece of military equipment? What happens to the video and audio that will be taken with the new robot? Who keeps it? Who has access to it? And for how long will that be? Where will this be stored and how readily available will the robot to be? Why can't the Santa Cruz Police Department team up with other law enforcement agencies to have one throwbot to be shared by all the agencies of the county, saving time, money, and training. I thank you for your time, answering the questions and the thoughtful consideration. Good evening. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Darius Mosinin here. I just got done watching the Netflix special or documentary about Waco. David Koresh was able to get a 50 caliber gun delivered in the mail. There are more guns than cell phones in this country. As long as that exists, I want my police force on top of that. I want that we have, they're understaffed. How do we resolve that? Technology. We need this kind of technology. We need maybe another Bearcat. We need a force multiplier so they can get their arms around this gun ep epidemic and, you know, fascination we have in this country. And there's no one in this room, there's nobody online, there's nobody in this community that goes to their job not knowing whether to come back alive that night. So I would like to see these folks armed more than us, the general public is allowed to have, which is pretty significant and irrational but that's the world we live in that's i mean that's the country we live in so military if it's call it military equipment call it force multiplication call it technology we need more of it thank you thank you miss bush and one more person online let's go to them at this point good afternoon Yes, members of the community, this is uh, Robert Norris calling from Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. Um, I think I would echo the concerns that Ron Pomerantz and others have had, but not just about any, any particular item, but rather the general militarization that's going on here. I mean, let's look at these items. The number of them is, is quite breathtaking. I mean, there's, there's robots, there's unmanned aerial vehicles, there's armored personnel character. There's a Ford F-3050 transport vehicle. There's command and control vehicles. There's firearms of greater than 50 caliber, firearms of various categories as well in that regard. 
Uh, in addition, ammunition, specialized firearms and ammunition, flashbang, tear gas, and pepper balls, chemical agents, tear gas, I guess my uh, pepper ball guns, pepper balls, my most recent experience with the police had to do with them with eight police officers announcing that anyone serving food at City Hall would be arrested, the food would be seized from them, they would be taken to jail, and their property confiscated. This happened two weeks ago at City Hall. As long as there's irresponsible and essentially a lack of transparent and lack of rational uh command in the police department to give these folks more weapons than they already have teeming with weapons to me is to put the cart before the horse uh, and, and you want to have the training you want to have the other things first but more important you have to ask yourself hasn't the country been reacting to the reality that uh, the people that suffer most are minorities from this kind of uh overly militarized police force in all kinds of cities. And if you think Santa Cruz is a somehow shining exception, you need to look at some of the background of racial discrimination here that is not being told and is not being documented and is not being uh, passed on clearly by staff and by the police department itself. You've got to come clean on these issues first before you start adding more arms. and. You also have to ask, as with regard to what Mr. Merzeran just said, uh, when's the last time a police officer actually protected you? Maybe they protect people in power. Maybe they protect large property owners. Maybe they protect merchants by going around and harassing homeless people who are on the streets sitting down on Pacific Avenue. But ask yourself, as you think about this, in, how many times in your life have you actually gotten a police officer to protect and defend you, hasn't that rather been other citizens who've stepped in to help in most situations? Police can't get there in time, for one thing. And to simply... ...is a big mistake. That's it. Thank you, sir. Anyone else in chambers wish to comment on the item? Ms. Bush, we have one more person online. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Council. I wasn't intending to comment on this item, but you've had a lot of really hysterical commenters just making really outrageously false statements. This is not a weapon. This is a tool so that police can assess the situation and make it more safe for everyone. I think a lot of people who've uh, commented on this item are, I don't know, they're getting their therapy here. <laughs> so just, you know, this is just a good tool for the police. It's not a weapon, uh, just to prove it. And it's also not gonna cost the city any money. People are talking about how much it's gonna cost and how we should share it. No, it's just approve it and be done with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else in chambers wish to comment? Ms. Bush, anyone else online? Thank you very much. Matter is back before the council. A motion would be in order. Motion, Ms. Bruner is recognized. Uh, I move the staff recommendation for item 25. Motion, is there a second? If I could just interject super briefly. Uh, sorry, after the materials were published, we noticed a clerical error that impacts the staff recommendation. Uh, so um, essentially, um, got Stephanie Duck here who can potentially speak to it, but um, I'll let Stephanie speak to it because she's she's more familiar than I am. There she is. Who, who is speaking to it? Sorry, Stephanie Duck is an attorney in our office and she's remotely here. Um, she'll just speak for a quick second if that's okay. Well, She's yes. behind you in, it, on your screen. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Stephanie Duck, attorney with the uh, city attorney's office. I apologize for this. I just want to explain um, just very briefly a, a clerical error to make sure that everyone's looking at the right thing here. Um, in the document titled Amended Santa Cruz Police Department Policy, on page seven, that attaches um, the policy that we're requesting that the council. Um, 
approved with this policy. That amended equipment list is a slightly older version and is not the version that we are asking you to approve. The version we are asking you to approve is the track changes version. So there's a document titled Santa Cruz Police Military Equipment Inventory Track Changes. That is the document that should ultimately be incorporated into the policy. It's very minor changes, but I just wanted to point out so that we make sure that this final version is incorporated into the policy. Thank you. Let me, yeah. hold on just a second here. Yes, does that, are, are you suggesting this changes the recommendation? You know, the motion language is pretty good as it is. Um, if you read it, it says approve Santa Cruz Police Department Policy 705, incorporating the amended inventory of military equipment as defined by Assembly Bill 481. I think that motion can stay if, the, if that was what the council wants, but I just wanted to make it abundantly clear that we are referring to um, the document that's, I believe, entitled Santa Cruz Police Military Equipment Inventory and Track Changes, which was in your agenda materials. Ms. Bush, is that clear to you what, what has just been referenced? Thank you. Is the maker of the motion, is that your motion? Yes. That and is your motion. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Newsom under debate and discussion. If you wish to comment? Yes. And open on your motion. Uh, thank you. I wanted to um, briefly, um, there were a couple of questions that came up, and I just wanted to ask um, if on the new um, updated model of the Throwbot, if it can record audio or is the audio live? If you know the answer to that. The answer is, is that it will record the audio. It's no different and will be a part of our uh, body-worn camera policy. If you think about we're deploying this equipment during an exigent circumstance, such as a hostage rescue sort of scenario, or we're, we're utilizing this piece of equipment during a warrant service or an arrest warrant sort of service where we are legally able to be where we are as well as the piece of equipment. Um, everything, including our own tactical team members or police officers, all of that is evidence. It is entirely critical to collect that evidence if statements are made by somebody in an incident like this, and it was absolutely uh, critical to capture that as, as evidence and introduced into the courts. So yes. Thank you. Um, how many times is the current model used in a year, approximately, if you don't have exact numbers? Off? I'll let Sergeant Trog address that. Uh, probably in estimation and in, in live operations, probably three to four times a year. It gets used in training rather regularly. And can you, do you have an example of a scenario that it was used in? Uh, one of the more recent examples were officers were at a residence to serve an arrest warrant on a subject who had a felony domestic violence uh, arrest warrant and had be was believed to be barricaded in the residence. The robot was used to locate that person in the residence prior to officers going in and taking that person into custody. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you. I, so I first want to say um, I appreciate you bringing this to us. I appreciate your efforts to comply with the AB 481 uh, law. And I recognize that this is new for our uh, community, for the police department. Um, and I, I want to say I, I really want to start out by acknowledging the legitimate safety concerns that, that you have uh, going into to work. So just it's been said by members of the public, but I, I see that. And, um, and I support uh, using uh, tools that are um, not lethal. And um, so I have no problem with the, the, um, the ask. Um, my, the I will say the materials were confusing uh, as presented. And, and, so, and I think that is um, reflected in a lot of the comments we've received about the inventory writ large and the overall policy. Um, and I do have 
lots of things to say about that, but that's another agenda item that I understand is coming um, at, in later in April. And um, but so for now, I just wanted to just, I guess my ask would be um, that when we get these items, if it just making it clear what the ask is and um, uh, yeah, I'm kind of maybe trying to separate that out so we're not um, looking at the entire policy without some uh, kind of acknowledgement that that's not what we're doing as part of the agenda item. I recognize that it requires an ordinance change and so that's why you're doing it the way you're doing it, but it just was confusing. So um, I, it would be great to uh, maybe uh, reduce that confusion for the future. Um, and then I, I did have uh, a couple of questions um, that I wanted to just follow up um, and I appreciate the um, questions that Council Member Bruner asked, but I, there were a few others that I have heard. Um, and so what about training um, for use of these devices? How, how does that, um, how do you, how does that ha happen? The training for it is not very intensive. Um, it's much like operating a video game controller. Um, so really what it comes down to is knowing the capabilities of the device, how to properly turn it on, turn it off, and then uh, use the remote control to, to operate the device. That's the extent of the training. It is not intensive. Um, we do it with uh, all of our staff, uh, patrol staff at varying times throughout the year. Everybody gets a chance to use it and we've used it. Uh, the, the Teen Public Safety Academy, the kids love driving this thing around. So the, the training is not intensive. And, and that's the same for all the, I don't know if it's a class of devices, but we did hear, and I, I've gotten a lot of emails about the differences between these um, devices, the Throwbot, the Avatar, the Throwbot 2, that they're all in the so, same category? I, yeah, they are, but part of the legislation requires that we also in our list include equipment that's available to us, but we do not possess. And the avatar is not our equipment. It is the sheriff's office equipment, but it is at our request available to us. So, you know, we're trying to comply with this new legislation that's really m murky at best. Um, but uh, yeah, that's why that that piece of equipment is is in our list because the legislation actually required it. Gotcha. And then um, just the other kind of question, comment, I guess I want to make is about the way that we, that this was received and printed through Lexapol as if it was on the list, um, but we hadn't approved it yet. So just again, trying to understand, um, it's, it's, it's kind of spoken about or written about as if it's happening and we're approving it today. So um, how to, just wondering why that is the case. I, I guess to answer that best is just presenting what the the new policy would look like if we were approved to acquire this. It, it's, it is confusing because when we change our equipment list, that inherently changes the policy, hence right. why we need right. to present this to, to the governing body. So um, we could try in the future to just address the, the small piece, but we were trying to just include everything that's on there once again just showcasing what's on the list in, in totality um, instead of just highlighting just the one piece that we're talking about. But maybe that added confusion. Just again, just I'll, I'll finish up, but um, it, it just maybe it, like in the agenda report or something, we could have some kind of explanation of why it, it looks the way it does, um, because I do think it's confusing. I mean, it certainly was confusing for me and I and members of the public have seemed to express that, too. Thanks. For the debate or discussion, for clarification purposes, not a weapon, is it? No. Thank you. For the debate and discussion, seeing hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Sergeant Chief, thank you very much. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item number 26. This is, uh, was that a throwbot? <laughs> My goodness. Instant use. All right. We are on item 26.
This is a $127 million loan from Water Infrastructure and Finance Innovation Act loan to support implementation of approved water capital improvement, excuse me, capital investment projects. Ms. Menard, good afternoon again. Do this often enough. I'm giving you all a chance to take a little bit of a deep breath. There we go. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Good afternoon. Rosemary Menard, I'm the director of the Water Department, and with me today is David Baum, who's our chief financial officer. And I want to, um, I'm going to give you the slideshow version here. Um, so we're here today to talk a little bit about uh, this uh, request for your you to approve a loan application for the um, Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act with you. EPA's program that uh, was developed, I think, after 2018. And uh, to talk a little bit about this and put it in a context, I want to talk a little bit about our long-range financial plan. Several of you were on the council when we adopted that plan in 2021, which was actually an update of the plan that we developed and adopted in 2016. And I want to talk a little bit about that and kind of the, the basis for uh, what that plan is. But it's all really about funding our uh, major capital improvement program. So then we're going to talk about the proposed projects that we want to fund out of the WIPI loan and then um, loan structure and capital structure. So um, for those of you who've been involved in, with us in, in this, plan, this financial planning process over time, you know that we basically do this by talking about what our needs are on both operating and capital and then also uh, having identified a set of financial policies and goals involving things like debt service coverage and reserve levels, pay-as-you-go capital versus debt finance capital. And in particular, these things really help us. Uh, the financial policies and goals are really important to helping us maintain, establish and maintain a good credit uh, report. So just like you would want to do for if you were going to buy a house, we're buying several houses here. Um, and so we want, we want to have a good credit score, and these things contribute to our having that. That financial plan then uh, it comes out and helps us to understand what our revenue requirements are over the long haul. Then we make some decisions about how much water we think we're going to sell and a rate structure design, which we have some control over even under Prop 218, which uh, you know we use to develop our rates. And then we bring proposed rates to the council, which we did in November of uh, 2021 for a five-year period starting at the beginning of fiscal 22, um, and those rates are now in place. But, excuse me, fiscal 23, those rates are now in place. And the issue here is that if we don't get the rate increases that we need based on this process, there has to be a feedback loop to go back and say, have to revise the capital program or change the operating expense uh, assumptions because this is all a big cycle. So. Uh, the work that we've done uh, has, you know, basically asked the why questions and the what and then how much and how big uh, the big picture and then the how and the customer class specific answers to the how much questions. Um, I'm really not going to walk you through every single one of these, but in the long range financial plan document, it has basically uh, Ten, five or six actions that are looked at of what we're really trying to do with this. And clearly, the rehabilitate, replace it, uh, the infrastructure, critical infrastructure, uh, dealing with water supply reliability, that's number one on this list. Um, we clearly have 
uh, adverse impacts of climate on a number of aspects of our infrastructure, both on the dry side and the wet side that we're trying to address. We're looking to implement those financial policies reserve goals to uh, give us, put us in a good, sustainable financial situation. You know, we're, we're a big business with uh, our, our operating budget and our capital budget, and we obviously have situations where we need to have flexibility to adapt to changing circumstances, maintain credit rating, uh, that's why I talked about that, achieve equitable allocation of capital costs and charges between current users and future system users, the infrastructure we're investing in is very long-lived, and it wouldn't be fair or reasonable for just the current ratepayers to pay the whole bill. So debt financing, the vast majority of this uh, infrastructure reinvestment, is really <coughs> important to sharing those costs over time. It does cost more. I don't think there's anybody who would say that if you pay an in interest instead of paying all up front, but it's not practical for us to pay all, all up front. And, uh, helps us to manage our rates in a predictable and reasonably stable manager manner, even if they are in, increasing over time. Um, we do have some pretty sophisticated, uh, and we take very seriously a set of financial reserves, targets and funding levels and coverage levels. We have an emergency fund, we have rate stabilization reserve, we have operate 180 days a minimum of operating cash, Again, for a big organization such as ours, these are really important and not that out of line. And one of the key factors that we manage to is a debt service coverage ratio of uh, 1.5, which means we have to have more than we need to pay debt service in any uh, given year in order to ensure that we're able to cover our debt, our cost of debt. So these are the, this is the background of the financial planning work we've done over time. We have a very sophisticated financial planning model we use in annual rate making, or not rate making, but budgeting and communications with our water commission about the work we're doing. Um, but it's really, I think, a, a very important piece of the work that we've done to set us up to make these investments in the water system. So we are going to propose uh, under this loan to cover, uh, the loan program only covers up to 49% of the cost and you have to find the rest from other sources, either uh, market rate debt or uh, state revolving loan debt in, or in some cases. These are the four projects, the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant that you heard about earlier, the FIP, uh, Mill Creek Pipeline Project, the segment between uh, Graham Hill and Belton. <laughs> A university tank four replacement, which is part of our treated water system that serves the uh, university and uh, aquifer storage and recovery, which is part of our um, our program to look at water supply augmentation and to help us meet a reliability goal that was part of uh, securing our water future policy that was adopted last year. So very quickly, these are just a, a little bit more about the four projects. Um, the Graham Hill water treatment plant it serves 95, produces 95% of all the drinking water. If this plant goes out of service, uh, it's basically boil water until it's back in service. Um, it's a very expensive project. You saw some information about this earlier. Um, whoops. Um, the, uh, this is the uh, Mill Creek pipeline segment. And again, you saw this map earlier. 4.4 mile stretch, it's a 24 inch diameter pipeline and this is really a main artery. Uh, when those breaks occur, we basically don't have way to get water from our storage reservoir to our treatment plant and it becomes a little bit of a crisis, um, which, well, <laughs> you didn't notice it, but the people in my office noticed it when it was going on like a couple of weeks ago and sometime earlier in January. Um, but they work really hard to avoid having it be a problem, but when the, water, the water's not available, it does get to be a problem pretty darn quick. Um, another one is University Tank 4. It's up as part of the pump system on the west side. This, this uh, is a 1965 um, steel tank that has, needs to be replaced now, and it's probably the last one of the, all of our distribution storage tanks. We've done a lot of work on these over the last number of years, the De La Viega tanks. U2 and U5 have already been replaced and um, are in service. 
Obviously, Bay Street Reservoir was in, was replaced about a decade ago, and it's obviously helping us um, very you know meet our needs on a daily basis. And a lot of these issues are driven not just by infrastructure condition, but also by seismic standards, which are really important for us. And then finally, where is the $95 million project to develop aquifer store, storage and recovery in the Mid-County Basin, which is much farther ahead in terms of the development of projects down there, and then also the um, Santa Margarita Basin, which is up in the Scotts Valley area. Very actively engaged with the groundwater work in both those basins and have a lot of really good partnership relationships with others in the region. Um, so when completed, these projects will, you know, build resilience, uh, improve supply reliability, improve water quality, increase operational flexibility to balance the demands of uh, meeting water supply needs and also in-stream flows, a, a really important aspect of the way we manage the water system and replace critical infrastructure that's reached the end of its useful life. So. The term sheet for this uh, particular uh, loan application is it has debt covenants involving um, a security pledge of net revenues. Um, a number of years ago, we did a charter change to make it clear that we have the ability to do revenue bonds for and make uh, commitments of revenues from the water system to pay these kinds of uh, costs. It, we have to have a... Um, a couple of things here related to um, being able to cover the cost of debt service and being able to do that in uh, the context of not just the debt that we're obligating ourselves to here, but also the debt that we already have. So um, it's really kind of looking at the whole package. And then um, it's $127,730,000. Um, it has a current estimated interest rate of 3.75%. It's, that's linked to a um, government securities rate that changes on a day-by-day -day basis. This, uh, you know, the timing that we're in in terms of some of this issuance of debt is really being driven by the changes, what's going on in the, um, in the current interest market and, and the Fed's uh, policies. We do have some really very um, uh, large debt that we've uh, undertaken as part of working with the State Revolving Loan Fund that's at 1.4% interest. So we got some things done uh, in a time frame when we could fund it with uh, money that costs less than this is gonna cost us. Um, it has a final maturity of basically 40 years out with the first five years, can, the interest is, can be interest only, and then a 35 year repayment print, print, uh, uh, time frame for the principal and interest. Um, it doesn't have prepayment penalties and has no uh, call date on it so that if we get funding from someplace else or uh, the projects that we're looking for, like SRF funding, which is now at about 2%, we can basically pay this back and uh, not be obligated. And uh, like uh, almost everything else we have, the loan funds are available on a reimbursement basis. So we have to have cash flow available uh, to us in order to cover the costs up front and then we file the claims and we get reimbursed. And one of the good things about this program is the reimbursement rate is happening apparently quite a bit faster in the week or two kind of time frame versus what we get with the state, which is often five to six months. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, we will take your questions. And I, we also have our bond council on um, online, um, Chick Adams, who's with Jones Hall and has been the Water Department's Bond Council and the City's Bond Council for a long time. Thank you very much. It was a very good presentation. Very much appreciated. Uh, let me see if there are questions by council members. Of a, uh, I have a question. Uh, is that debt, can we refinance that uh, during the term of the loan? Yes, it doesn't have a call. It doesn't have a call date. That's it, what I it's not. Um, yeah. It doesn't have that kind of prohibition prepayment. It would basically be a prepayment yeah. uh, of the that debt. So if interest rate conditions uh, change and well, are will. better, they will. <laughs> they will so change. Which way will they go? That's, That's the right. question. Um, we do have that option to do that. 
And we do have some other debt, obviously, over the number of years, some of which is coming up that has a call date, but not not in a better situation. Had we still been where we were last year or even the year before, we would certainly be looking at refinancing some of that debt. Buyer of these bonds, are they tax-free? Yes. Thank I'm you. I'm going to let. Thank you. Are there further questions, comments? Anyone with us wish to make comment on this item, please come forward if you wish to do so. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Wow, the way this reads, resolution authorizing the city to enter into a loan agreement with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Sure sounds like uh, the EPA is a bank. So I may have been physically present during the 22-23 budget. I think the city's budget was $197 million. At the time, I believe they were negotiating between 163 and 160 mil, 163 and 167 million dollar loan. It had to do with the uh, San Lorenzo Valley watershed. That's not the exact name. I forget what it's called. And I believe it was shared that the uh, value of the San Lorenzo watershed was over a billion dollars. Okay. So the United States Environmental Protection Agency is for-profit corporation and hopefully groups of citizens are going to get together and sue them for trillions of dollars along with BlackRock because the criminal malfeasance of deliberately causing a chemical reaction which turned all those chemicals into dioxins some people just describe that that as being a billion times more toxic than Roundup it's called forever chemicals you can clean them. Some areas are easier than others. But this is all part of a land grab. How to come back into what's going on in Santa Cruz? That's, some, that's a pretty pristine watershed. You know, why would somebody be taking a loan from a company that really should be at a zero value? So, of course, they want to loan money to something that's actually worth something. Some of the capital improvements in Santa Cruz? That new line, uh, some, of, some of it's only 8 inch, some of it's 16, they're pumping the sewage into the water table in Mid-County. You know, by EPA standards, maybe that's safe. But let's talk about the EPA standards. They're <coughs> testing for vinyl chloride. Well, the vinyl chloride is gone. But the other forever chemicals, some were used as World War II, very toxic nerve gases. There's been a lot of information going on. So I'm recommending a different way that this county try to get some money than to try to use the EPA as a bank, because uh, EPA is really thanking you for signing over your water rights. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online on this item? We do. We're, we're going to alternate back and forth. We're going to take someone online. We'll be right with you. Uh, person online, good afternoon. Okay, I'll make this real short. Uh, I missed the part where you explained how much the water rates are going up, considering rates were already scheduled to go up astronomically year after year for several more years. Uh, and one of these items uh, isn't really a replacement or repair. And uh, uh, I'm just curious about, curious about that. Thanks. Is that the end of your comments, sir? Oh, very good. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my concerns have to do with uh, um, some revelations that came out with the CZU fire of a couple years ago. I believe it was 2020 now at the end of August, September. Um, I don't know the name of the water director who is... Um, who I am referring to. I don't recall her name. I wasn't the person to make the phone call. A friend of mine did. But essentially what happened is that the water pipes that are in use generally in the mountains and in the mountain towns uh, melted. They melted. They were destroyed by the fire 
And there's a particularly extremely toxic chemical. I also don't know the name of that. I'm not going to pretend that I can, uh, that I have this, um, this information, but it is an extremely toxic chemical in particular would be going into the water and then into the reservoir. And so <clears throat> my point is just that um, I understand that our council and our government is very much related to the general kind of boom and bust capitalism that we're all feeling the pain of or the pleasure of, depending on where you are in the spectrum of um, wealth and income. Um, but this is a question about public health, and that is why I'm, I am speaking. I am hoping that you all are hearing this. I'm home, hoping the public is hearing this. My <coughs> close friend who called the water director when at that time, she basically said, we are aware of it, we're doing what we can, yada, 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 yada. And this is exactly the kind of thing where when we're wanting to approve an, a, a loan like this that is so um, taxing um, on the public and might be a very, very wise thing to do. I'm not calling that into question. What I am calling into question is that the public have the information about the lethally toxic chemicals that our previous governments here in Santa Cruz and in the towns in the mountains have decided to make our water pipes out of that are now being destroyed in these lethal fires, these new types of fires, these climate change driven fires that are so extreme that they're melting all the water pipes and that toxic chemical is leaching into our water system. This is exactly the type of information that needs to be brought out at a time like this, when you're thinking about, you know, this kind of a commitment, a financial commitment. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Someone online, Ms. Bush? No? Good afternoon, sir. Hi, my name is Ron Goodman. Um, I just wanted to say I really appreciate that uh, staff has made such a thoughtful proposal for water, um, my family, my community, I personally, I think we all really appreciate having water and I encourage you to support this plan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further testimony, any further comment? No one else online? Thank you. Matters back before the council. I'll move the recommendation. Ms. Watkins moves. Vice Mayor second. Adoption of the staff recommendation. Uh, I want to use this moment because of the gentlelady's comment. Would I be right in assuming the following? There's two things going on here. There's all of that business with the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, which is the provider of water in the San Lorenzo Valley, Lompico, Zianti, Felton area. They did, in fact, have a lot of PVC pipe and other plastic pipe in their water s delivery system, some of which melted during those fires. That is not the city of Santa Cruz, nor does that have anything to do with what we're doing, except to the extent that we take water from the San Lorenzo Valley. But this is for a completely different purpose that is not tied into. Is that correct? It, that's correct. Although I will tell you, contextually, we are designing the treatment process for the upgraded uh, water treatment plant to acknowledge that things that they weren't thinking were going to be issues in 1960 or 55 when they started that design process could potentially be issues now. We know that there's a lot of septic tank influent, uh, particularly in the not the really, really wet periods or the really, really dry periods, but that sort of more moderate that, that do uh, introduce things into the supply that we are definitely monitoring for, we're looking at, we're uh, taking into account in the treatment process design. And I think in particular with respect to uh, rel relatively uh, understanding that we did a lot of monitoring after the fire to see what was coming at us from, you know, just downstream, partly because it was a really dry year in the winter immediately following that fire. We didn't get a ton of stuff coming off in the mud flows and that kind of thing. 
We're ongoing monitoring, and so we're looking to see what's going on in the watershed. Recently published a, uh, a sanitary survey and was briefed before the Water Commission of, of the watershed, uh, briefed before the Water Commission in um, March. And uh, I think that it's really important to know that that data is available. It's out there. It's public. It's part of the record. And we are happy to answer anybody's questions. Uh, obviously, we don't have the treatment in place right now to deal with whatever, but the plan is to make this treatment plant do what it needs to do, not just backward looking, but definitely current and forward looking. Very good. I want to thank the gentlelady for raising that issue and your clarification as to do is who is doing what, but we're not saying uh, that that is not an issue for us because that is a major source of our water. Thank you very much. Further debate or discussions? Yes, Ms. Brown. I, I just wanted to ask a question. Thank you for, once again, uh, another um, really clear and streamlined presentation. Gives me confidence every time. Um, I, um, I did want to ask because it, somebody mentioned it and I, I just started thinking about how rate payers will think about uh, an item like this. And um, so if you could just talk about how this interfaces with rate structure. My understanding is we have one set and yes. so this is factored in, but yes. I, I wanted to just yes. raise it here since people so, have asked. So part of the goal of doing the long range financial planning uh, that we do is to look not just one year at a time, but actually our long range financial plan looked out 15 years and took the major capital reinvestments that needed to be done and spread those out over that period of time based on both uh, when the projects could be ready. They can't, you can't do everything at once, even if you had the money to do everything at once, because the system has to operate while you do these projects. So that we have a, a long range view of what it's going to take. And out of that financial plan comes the five year uh, estimated revenue requirements that are added to the operating revenue that will, along with a strategy of debt financing versus pay-as-you-go, becomes the basis for the rate revenue that we um, need to generate. So it's a it's a pretty tight and and well put together process uh, that looks at how are we going to pay for this stuff. It was one of the major uh, reasons for doing the longer range plan because. You can't make that up year by year. You really have to plan it in and understand what, you know, both policy-wise, are you going to try to pay for it all with cash? Are you going to, what part is debt finance versus cash finance? That's the kind of work we've done. And did it in 2016 to start the process and then updated it in 2021 uh, along with the next increment of rates. That, those rates go through fiscal 27. Thank you. For the questions or comments, seeing and hearing none, I believe there is a motion. Is that correct, Ms. Bush? We have a motion on the table. We do. I just need to clarify who the seconder was. I think. Okay. It was. And the seconder was. There we go. Uh, it is the vice mayor. Mm -hmm. All right. All debate having ceased. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Brunner. Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Akili? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank Menard. You. Thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you for those who make comments on this. We appreciate your participation in this. We are on file item number 27. Uh, this is an appeal of a proposed single space marking on David Way. We have an update on this. The, assert, the assistant uh, city attorney is recognized. Uh, we have looked at this issue and some coastal issues have coastal act issues have been raised and uh, we're recommending that this item be postponed so that our office can further assess those issues. Objection. The item is continued to a date uncertain uh, pending receiving further advice from council. Uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Huffker, we have further business to come before the council today. Ms. Bush, further business to come um, before yes, the council. Yes, and I, if we can go back to 27 really quick, Absolutely. I just want to confirm the recommendation language was to defer it to the April 11th meeting. That's correct. 
Okay. Very good. So it is a date okay. certain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, that. And then we have to do um, oral communication. Yes. But. Did you read, did you, did that require a motion? It's written in the. It sounds. Yeah, let's do a motion to defer the item. Okay, motion to continue to a date certain. April, give me that again, 11th. 11th. Thank you very much. So motion by Ms. Watkins, second by the Vice Mayor. Uh, debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Council Members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We're on oral communications. This would be the opportunity for anyone to address the City Council on a mem on a, an item under our jurisdiction, but not on today's City Council agenda. Is there anyone online, Ms. Uh, good. Let's go with someone online first, and then we'll alternate back and forth between online and those who have joined us in chambers. Good afternoon. Yes, hello. This is Gary Phillip. Hey, while there seems an exclusive priority in giving protection to sand here instead of cliffs or very valuable property assets, please note it has been established by various scientific studies spanning decades that while some beaches can protect cliffs, more so on average, California cliffs with beaches generally erode 50% faster than ones without sand, while unarmored cliffs erode three times faster than armored ones. Those factors can multiply. Erosion occurs in difficult to predict cycles, but when it occurs, the cycle's on until it isn't. I repeat again, there is history suggesting the public may realign existing radical management retreat cliff erosion strategies for you toward more consideration of protecting private and public property once more assets fall into the sea. But by then, it would really be too late to delay catastrophe by very much. As to your now inexcusable failure to declare the COVID state of emergency is over, while seemingly adopting a sneak out the back jack silent much delayed exploration strategy, I would point out the city's website is still passing out health advice, pushing MNRA gene therapy jabs, including in my opinion, a moral push for childhood vaccinations. Excess mortality continues crushing life expectancy in the United States. Many informed people with studies to back it up finger the vaccinations. What should be the healthiest among us, working age people are now dropping dead or developing serious maladies while even heavily vaccinated, almost criminally authoritarian COVID iron fisted countries like Australia and New Zealand now give advice against vaccinations for normal people under 50 because of their now wildly inflated excess mortality. You're not passing out helpful uh, advice like age appropriate colonoscopies here but more so acting, uh, continuing to act like another drug pushing Pfizer ad. Is that two minutes? That can't be two minutes. Can it? It was. Yeah, that was two minutes, but take a second if you'd like to wrap up your comments, sir. Okay. Do you want me to, I took away his permission. Do you want me to put it back on? Yeah, yeah, just make sure. Didn't mean to cut you off. I want to make sure you can finish your thought. Okay. And, and while you're removing that, why don't you consider removing any of the numerous proven COVID propaganda lies that may also still be there? Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, my name is James, public comments. Maybe I'll get my silver umbrella back. I left here a month ago. So I had the pleasure to say good morning to Sheriff Jim Hart this morning. He said, good morning, James, how are you? And I said, incredible. Now, uh, Gail Newell was also in the room, and as it turns out, there were a lot of legislative people there after my public comments, which I think was, I forgot, it's 31 minutes. They all left. That wasn't my intention. I had public comments at uh, 97 minutes were quite interesting. So I can't bring up things that are actually on the agenda but uh, along the lines of the frequency weapons, which was just completely brushed over and the only people being thrown under the bus more than teachers and law enforcement, teachers and students in law enforcement, you know, anybody can do their own research. I don't expect people to believe a word I say. You should always do your own research. But there are people that have put up different kinds of graphs and scales, and when you look up 
wireless frequency weapons effects, the flu, and COVID. They're identical. You know, why, uh, why, change that's, why change something that's very common? Human beings are very special creatures. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of exosomes that help our bodies when our um, natural bacteria can't take their thing cannot take care of things, they're natural uh, surfactants and soaps. So there's so many issues that are going to be coming up that this board is just not talking about. And uh, everybody can change. It's nice to see all of you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. Thank you. You have a nice evening as well. Someone online. Hello, uh, this is Jasmine Mia. Good evening. Um, as one of the presenters said, we are experiencing uh, whiplash weather. <clears throat> Therefore, we do not have much lead time for severe weather alerts. Um, there was actually even an alert for gale force winds today. Um, and I didn't notice that till last night. Um, uh, while I don't know if there are other big storms on the horizon, I urge the city to be prepared to offer emergency shelter whenever conditions would necessitate it. Personally, I think we should have shelter available for everyone um, all the time, but at least open up enough space during dangerous weather or extra cold conditions. Many of us were disappointed that during a past atmospheric river, the city only opened the Depot Park building. Please have a better plan for future incidents. I have heard that the city's responsibility is to offer brick and mortar space and that the county is supposed to offer staffing. Well, in Depot Park, Free Guide provided the services. Also, not that much oversight is needed. Please at least do your job and ensure adequate shelter, both in amount of space and in the amount of time it is open. Let's not leave our unhoused neighbors out in the cold rain and dangerous stormy weather in which they could die from a fallen tree or debris flying through the wind. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My comments are along the lines of the caller that we were just listening to. Um, I happened recently to stumble into a copy of a book by um, Ward Churchill, who's a very um, well thought of academic. I don't know if he's still living. He wrote um, a lot on Native American rights and our laws. And he wrote a book that the one I stumbled into called Indians Are Us. And he begins his book talking about genocide and the definitions of genocide. And so it just so happens that for the last since, I don't know, roughly about six months, since about last August, I once again wanted to do some personal investigation into who who are the homeless people, who were the homeless people at the Benchlands Park. And I did some art organizing for the Homeless Union. I went to many meetings and wanted to bridge the organizations over through the holidays because the holidays are particularly difficult for many single um, homeless people. Singles tend to be unaddressed as well as, and, and if you compare how well we will try to address the needs of pregnant women and families. Single adults particularly go um, with their needs unmet, as the caller was just saying. I would urge the city to consider that what we are really engaging in is a form of genocide of our own people. And I'm not using that word carelessly, and I'm not using that word without actual Years and years of deliberations. I've studied civil rights. I've studied slavery. I've sl studied these movements personally. I've taken many courses. I've made it my life's work, you might say. And so we are killing not only people who are American citizens. We are killing immigrants who are out there. We are killing very many people who are mentally ill and people who just need basic shelter. Please step up and take responsibility for the deaths you all are responsible for. Thank Anyone you. online? Ms. Bush? Yes. Yes. Next person online. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, uh, Reggie Meisler here with Santa Cruz Cares. I just want to quickly speak about restriping, not from the item 27 perspective, uh, but from the broader perspective. Um, I am happy that staff deferred item 27, but I am also sad. I'm sad because I, this was a, flag, a flagrant misuse of that permit, that coastal design permit. The only reason staff deferred this is not because they realized they had a come to Jesus moment, that this was a horrible, uh, mean-spirited, discriminatory, and hateful thing to do. 
but because I put pressure on the Coastal Commission enforcement arm to not allow them to do it. This was a blatant street by street strategy to backdoor the city's way into an RV ban, sidestepping the need to negotiate the terms of the OVO with the Coastal Commission. And why did the city feel the need to do that? Because the Coastal Commission was never going to accept the OVO. The Coastal Act does not accept flagrantly discriminatory and hateful policies like the OVO because the mission of the Coastal uh, Commission is sadly more progressive than our city council. Its purpose is to explicitly prevent racist, classist, and anti-houseless forces of capitalism from privatizing our land and coastal resources and not to allow it to be a gated community that only the wealthy and mostly white are allowed to enter. So it is frankly outrageous that city staff continues to use its limited resources, finding new and creative ways to criminalize the poor as they have done here, instead of do what is evidence-based, what we've been talking about for years, give them what they need, porta potties, trash receptacles, needle disposal, mobile gray water dumping. There's a 60 person wait for tier three. Everyone on Delaware Avenue wants to get into tier three safe parking and you're not doing it. You're just criminalizing them more. So let this be a lesson. We will continue with more litigation if you keep going down this road. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Spring weather, huh? Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about Ocean Street um, because I feel like it's uh, it's a very uh, keystone uh, area of the city. Um, I'd uh, meant to speak with uh, Son Sonia about it, um, uh, you know, uh, while while she was uh, uh, mayor, but uh, I I just uh, I feel really strongly that that o Ocean Street for a variety of reasons um, that I could enumerate, um, is highly neglected, a very highly neglected part of the city. Um, it's the first thing people see when they they come and, and go. And, uh, um, you know, we, there are lots of, often there are uh, items uh, uh, in front of the council uh, regarding uh, dangerous intersections, and uh, more than one is on Ocean Street. Um, can't, you could be said. I, I think, and uh, and there's all kinds of uh, you know you, you know things that you know uh, range from uh, decorative changes to um, you know uh, substantive changes that are maybe difficult to do because there's a little bit of uh, confusion about like well the county building is the county's problem and then um, you know uh, how, how do we enforce uh, say uh, safe you know uh, safety um, uh, you know uh, Rick, you know uh, you know, if, if there were, if there were, uh, say, you know, kind of uh, stepped up enforcement of people driving unsafe in that area. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, a, a, often um, people come down Ocean Street and they think, well, um, you know, um, you know, woohoo, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Santa Cruz now, finally, after, you know, this long drive over the mountains. And uh, so it creates a lot of problems. And, you know, um, it's not that it doesn't look good now, but there's all kinds of things that could be improved. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? One more. Good afternoon. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. This is Joy Schendeldecker. Um, I just, I wanted to invite you all to, um, to a couple of events. Um, I'm part of a project that is part of the City Arts Redevelopment Grants, a uh, grant project um, that Andrew Perchin, a local psychotherapist and artist is, is doing. And we have a performance evening on the evening of April 15th at the 408 Project and a gallery opening at the Radius Gallery at the Tannery from two to four on uh, Sunday the 16th. This is the project, um, you can see the website, What's home.org and it's what's home creative listening across differences. Um, I was paired with Mayor Keeley for, um, for my part of the project. I'm one of the creative mediators and we'll have an installation in the gallery show. 
Um, I had a conversation with Mayor Keeley and a conversation with Greg Bennett, a friend of mine who is also an artist who um, lived in the Benchlands. And I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this project. I think it's gonna be um, wonderful. Uh, it, it's great that the city is supporting the arts and, um, and you know, we all need to have more difficult conversations. Um, I, I hope to have many, many more of them. Um, and then also another, another thing I'd like to invite everybody to attend is this Saturday's um, Housing Matters uh, March Against Homelessness. I'll be there with Santa Cruz Cares and, and possibly doing some crochet workshop um, as an extension of my What's Home um, a project. We'll see if that happens. So hope to see you all at, at these upcoming events. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schindeldecker. We appreciate that. Anyone else who's with us in chambers wish to make comments? Ms. Bush, anyone else online for the business come before us? No, no. Motion to adjourn would be in order. Ms. Golder moves <laughs> and Ms. Watkins seconds to adjourn the meeting non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries and so ordered. We stand adjourned. <laughs>